השם, השם נעשה ונצליח, שיהיו תורה. ברוך השם, good to be here. Uh, we are going to continue the uh, series, Mishnai Pirkei Avot. We have uh, uh, the same Mishnah that we started last week, just part two, which is uh, Mishnah Hei Tetvav, uh, 515. Uh, Shiur will also be uh, for Refua Shlema to uh, my dear friend Rav uh, David Boton Ben Yona. Shakadosh Baruch Hu will give him Refua Shlema, Refua Tanefesh, Refua Taguf. Also, uh, Levana Bat Sarah, Sarah Bat Levana, David Ben Nesriya, Doris Bat Jora, um, Elisheba Chaya Bat Sarah, uh, Dvora Bat Mercedes, um, Batya Bat Sarah, Yuda Ben Dvora, and all of Am Yisrael Bezot Hashem will have Refua Shlema, Refua Tanefesh, Refua Taguf. The uh, series we started uh, will list the... Uh, Pekei Avot series, as Baruch Hashem, has been very, very popular. Uh, and um, the last few shiurim, I think, have been uh, probably more uh, productive, at least what people are making comments about, than all of the other shiurim. Uh, a lot of people, Baruch Hashem, have done tshuva when it comes to the, uh, the three-part shiur that we did about anger. Uh, and then uh, one, the uh, few shulim we did about uh, amazing questions about God, different series. Uh, but also this uh, last week's shul uh, that we started uh, about this specific Mishnah, about the different types of students. If you haven't slept under a rock, then you'll probably notice that most people do not want to be students. Most people do not want to be Talmidim. Most people want to be rabbis. Most people want to be morim. They want to be teachers. And uh, if you look at the greatest rabbis in history, and you'll know that every one of them felt uncomfortable. Every single one of them felt uncomfortable calling themselves a rabbi. And that's why most of the time, when they sign letters, they sign letters, you'll see that they don't even use the term rabbi. They don't use the term rabbi so-and-so. Rabbi Kanievsky, Rabbi Ovadia, Rabbi... They don't use these terms. They don't use Rabbi. They just use their names. Because anyone that possesses real Chokhmah knows that in order to attain Chokhmah, you have to be a Talmid. You have to be a student. How long? Forever. So this Mishnah in Avot started telling us the different types of students that we have in the world, different types of people that we have in the world, and I told you that Be'ezat uh, Hashem, at the end of the, uh, this Mishnah, will also learn one of the greatest things that any student of the Torah would want to get, which is the exact instructions of how to get Ruach HaKodesh. Now obviously, it's not so simple. It's not like uh, going to buy a milkshake in the store. You don't just go, you buy something, and you pay a certain price, and you get Ruach HaKodesh. We're not the Nutzrim, we're not the Christians, that uh, every uh, second guy that, uh, you know, uh, wakes up in a good mood, says that uh, some angel spoke to him, or God spoke to him, or he spoke to God, and we're not uh, this Droh Kasuto that says that God speaks to him and says thank you every other day. We're talking about real Ruach HaKodesh. Now, of course, this is not to make a mockery of the issue. It's, the point is, is that we actually legitimately have instructions of how to attain it, both in the Gemara, as well as in the Sifrei Chachamim, but... It's not necessarily because any one of us is going to attain it or not, but it's, in essence, it's a map. It's a to-do list. If you're in the world as a Jew, it should be on your to-do list, meaning that you're supposed to do everything you possibly can to fulfill every one of the to-do list items. Maybe you'll be lucky enough and get Ruach HaKodesh but really has nothing to do with luck. It has to do more with effort. But the point is, is that regardless of whether you want to attain Ruach HaKodesh or not, you have to achieve all the things that are on that list in order to fulfill your tshuva obligation. So this we started last week. We started talking about the couple of Talmidim, a couple of different types of Talmidim. We'll go over that again today, cover some of the uh, brief facts of what we went over last week, and then start with the new. But also... 
cover some of the things that are going on in the world today to shed some light on the world of darkness that we live in that uh, shows us how far we are from being Talmidim. How far we are from being Talmidim. So the Mishnah in Avot says, Arba Amido Betalmidim. Ma'ir Lishmoa Umair Le'abed. Yitza Scharo Be'efsedo. Kashe Lishmoa Bekashe Le'abed. Yitza Efsedo Be'scharo. Ma'ir Lishmoa Bekashe Le'abed. Ze Chelek Tov. Kashe Lishmoa Umair Le'abed. Ze Chelek Ra. Translation. Excuse me. There are four types of students. First type, one who grasps quickly and forgets quickly. His gain is offset by his loss. Meaning, this is a guy that attends the shu. He gets everything. He understands basically what the, uh, what the speaker is saying. And uh, he understands it. He's got a sharp mind. Problem is, by tomorrow he forgot everything. Or 80% of it. By two days from now, 90%. A week, he forgot he's even a Jew. That's why he has to keep coming to the Jewim. So the fact that he's quick, and he's witty, and he's sharp, is good. But the problem is, he doesn't use that talent to its full potential. The Maharal and Midrash Shmuel both say that when it says his gain is offset by his, uh, by his loss, Yatsa Scharo Be'efsedo, Really what it's trying to say is that the, this expression means that the loss is actually a result of the gain. Meaning the only reason why he lost is because he gained so quickly. It was so easy for him to understand he didn't value the Torah. He treated it like he's uh, learning uh, you know, ABC. He treated it like he's learning math in school. He treated it like a secular subject and he didn't value... The Torah that he learned like he's supposed to, he didn't go over his notes. He didn't even write notes. He didn't even write notes. He didn't go over notes. He just thought, oh, it's good. Wow, nice. Ah, chazaku baruch. Wow. I'm going to come back next week. Next week comes back. So did you do uh, anything, any one point of what we covered last week? What would you say again last week? You know what? I'll watch it again on YouTube. Yatsas charo be'efsedo. Why? He just completely wasted three hours of his life. Now, even though he got schar, he got a reward for learning Torah. The Gemara in Masechet Brachot says, what do you get schar for? What do you get a reward for when you go to Shiur Torah? What's the reward for? The Gemara says you get a reward for walking. For walking to the Shiur Torah. In those days, they didn't have cars. They didn't have a $50,000 machine that's going to take you from place to place in 15 minutes. Back then, you actually had to walk. Or go on a horse or a donkey. But in those days, they didn't have a shul in every corner like they do in the U.S., Baruch Hashem, or in Israel. If you wanted to go, sometimes you had to walk uh, or uh, on a, ride a donkey for two weeks to go to a certain Chacham Shiur. And the Shiur itself may last for a week straight. So the Gemara asks, what did you get the schal for? What, is it good shiul? You got, you got a schal because you learned something to him? He says, no, you didn't get the schal for that. Why? Because Hashem wants to give you a full schal. Hashem wants to give you a full reward. And the reality is, if it's a good speaker, meaning that he has divrei Torah and not just his own opinion, like today's speakers, most people just talk about their opinion. Someone told me the other day, they listened to a certain rabbi. He said an hour, he spoke for an hour, and... In an hour, maybe five minutes had to do with the Torah. Maybe five minutes. Maybe. It's like a suffix. Maybe five minutes had to do with the Torah. The other 55 minutes, just chit-chat. Shul Torah. It's uh, Torah anytime. Torah anytime. B- big website. We have a shul in there also. Big rabbi. 55 minutes, he's chit-chatting with the people. Shtuyot, his own opinion, this, that, the other thing. But five minutes, Divre Torah. Should have just done a five minutes Shul Torah. More people would watch it anyway. People watch, five minutes shiuls. An hour shiul, not so much. Three hours shiul, not so much. The point is, Rabotai, is that the Gemara already tells us this is not a new thing. There's nothing new under the sun. Shlomo Melech says seven times in Ecclesiastes. What is he saying? 
He's saying Hashem wants to give you a full schar. If it's a real rabbi, it's going to give you divrei Torah, divrei Chachamim, Kodesh Kodeshim. Most likely, you're not going to understand most of what he says. Most likely. You're not going to understand everything that he's going to say. And even if you understand it, you may not remember the whole thing. He's telling me Chacham, he's giving you verses, he's giving you psukim, he's giving you this, he's giving you page numbers, he's giving you this, he's giving you this. Unless you're a computer, you should be giving this to you already. It's going to take, you're not going to remember everything, but Hashem wants to give you a full reward. How can He give you a full reward if you forgot half the shiur? How can He give you a full reward if you forgot 90% of the shiur? How? He says, I can't give you a full reward for the shiur, but I'll give you a full reward for walking. Why? That, you for, for sure you remember. Two weeks walk, you remember forever. The point is, He wants to give you a full reward for something you did and something you remember. The point is that Hashem is chesed from Hashem. Hashem tries to constantly give us more and more reward for things that, in essence, we really shouldn't be getting a reward for. If you wake up as a goy, do you wash your hands or no? You wash your hands. Goyim, wash the hands. But the goy, does he get a mitzvah for washing his hands? No, he doesn't get a mitzvah for washing his hands. But the Jew that doesn't eat tilat daim gets a mitzvah. The goy then... Goes to the bathroom. Goes to the bathroom. He leaves the bathroom. He goes on his date. Does he get a mitzvah for going to the bathroom? No. No mitzvah for going to the bathroom. He had to go to the bathroom. Go to the bathroom. The Jew goes to the bathroom. He comes out of the bathroom. He says, Asher Yatzal. Does he get a mitzvah? Gets a mitzvah. Both of them went to the bathroom. Both of them washed their hands. But only one of them gets a reward for it. Now what kind of reward is this? What kind of reward does the Jew get? The Chachamim tried to explain it in a way that we could understand, but in reality, if you understand it, you don't understand it. Why? They say that if you take all of the good, all of the good that ever existed in your life, all the good that ever existed in your life, and let's say you lived, I don't know, 120 years, okay? You had moments of good. Let's say once a week you had one out of seven days, fantastic. Let's just say, you are, have one of these good lives, one day out of seven weeks, you have 24 hours, just good. Just good. Imagine. So one out of seven days. Now you have 52 weeks a year, let's say. This, the uh, Goyim calendar, we'll just use it for, for, for simplicity. That's 52 days a year of good. Multiply that by 100 years. Now you take all of that, you put it into a little box. Put all that good, put it into a little box, and it's one moment. Okay? Now, Chachamim says it's not enough. Let's add some more. All the people that you know, your father, your mom, your sister, your brother, your cousin, your neighbor, your, the, 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 your boss, the guy you hate, the guy you like, the, the girl, the one, the rich, the poor, all of them that you know. You take all of their good from all their life, 120 years, and you put it in the same box. Same box. Chachamim says, not enough. Now take the rest of the world. Rest of the world. Eight billion people almost today. We're still in the same box. Not enough. Not enough. They say, take all of the people that ever lived and ever will live. In all of the history. According to a Jewish calendar, 5,778 years. Almost 6,000 years of good. This includes kings, queens, princes, princesses, uh, beggars, whatever, everybody. You think a beggar didn't have a good time? I bet you that a beggar has more good time than most average people. How? If he's normal, if he's normal in his mind. Why? For him, it doesn't take that much to be happy. You give him $20, you made his week. You, I give you 20000 like, ah, I wish it was 30000 you know, 40,000 would have been really good. I could have got the car that I wanted. 80,000 would have got the house. You already think about what you could have got with more. The beggar, 20 bucks, he's happy. Unless it's the beggar from New York that I saw one time. I gave her pizza. She says, no, I had pizza already today. I had pizza today. She was 150 pounds overweight, but she didn't want my pizza. Anyway, Chachamim say, take all the good of all the people that ever existed. Shh, in the same box with you. Put that all and dissect it into a single moment. Imagine how much good that is. 
the, the feeling is impossible to understand. They say that is not even the schar for the smallest mitzvah. Whatever you decide is the smallest mitzvah. You're not allowed to decide which one is the small mitzvah. We learn this from Pirkei Avot. The point being here is that all of that good is not even for a single mitzvah. And what do you get us for? For washing your hands in the morning. For saying modei ani. For going to the bathroom saying thank you Hashem that my body works and I didn't uh, you know, stay in the bathroom for three hours. Thank you Hashem that my body works and actually something came out and didn't stay in and I'm Hashem and Hashem well, what kind of feeling are you going to have the rest of the day? Thank you Hashem for actually making it work. I didn't get a heart attack while I was actually emptying out my body. Thank you, Hashem, that I'm able to see. Thank you, Hashem, that I'm able to touch. Thank you, Hashem, that I'm able to breathe. Thank you, Hashem, I'm able to do anything. Just for that. O mitzvot. The guy, what does he get? Nothing. Hashem found a way to give you all of that for nothing. What did you do? Say thank you? For what? For the same thing that the guy is doing. Such is the chesed of Hashem. Now, on the other hand, Rabotai Karim, Hashem is trying to give you a full reward for Shure Torah. He says you're going to get a full reward for Shur Torah for going there. But in today's world, most people let the Yetzirah in. Hashem told Kain. He says, you do tshuva, you do tshuva. It's good. I accept your korban. We'll be best friends. Everything's good. But if you don't, one, excuse me, one avira will lead to another one. Why? Because the Satan, the Malach Hamavid, the Yetzirah, all the same thing. They're all waiting, he's all waiting at the door. You leave him a little opening, you leave the door unlocked, that's it, he's going to run your house. You leave the door unlocked, he's coming to run your house. A little bit. So what happens? Oh yeah, listen, uh, I'll watch YouTube this week. I'm not going to go to show. I'm going to watch YouTube. Okay, one week you watch YouTube, two weeks you watch YouTube, Three weeks you watch YouTube. Before you know it, you're not coming at all. After a couple of months, you're not even watching YouTube. Before you know it, you forgot that you're Jewish. You're back to being a goy. And all of the reward that we just talked about is gone. It's gone. You're not getting it anymore. Why? <laughs> you're not doing that anymore. You're not doing it till the time. You're doing it till the time while you're eating. It's till the time while you're eating. You say, Modeani, while you're looking at the girl that's not your wife. Modeani that Hashem made some woman that I'm not allowed to look at. What are you doing? You're making averot. So the point is, Rabotai, the fire that you get from a shiu is not going to be the same fire you're going to get from YouTube, especially if you're able to go to the shiu. Now, if you live in Idaho, like somebody that I spoke to today, or you live in Montana, like another person that I sent a package to, or you live in certain places in the world that there's literally your next door neighbor, forget Judaism, your next door neighbor is 50 miles away. If you want a human, if you're looking for a cow, it's right next to your house. The cow, the horses, the donkeys, they're all next to your house. They're outside. They're all singing songs for you in the morning. But if you want a human being, 30, 40, 50 miles away. You want a Jew? Psh. Maybe in Mount Sinai. If you're in that situation, patul. You're patul until you, ha- until you move. You have to move. You can't live like that. You can't live in the middle of nowhere as a Jew. You have to be part of something. Unless everybody's Rashaim, which the Rambam says, if everyone around you is Rashaim, move to the desert. Become friends with the demons, the scorpions, and the, uh, and the snakes. But if you live in modern society, you live in Israel, you live in the U.S., you live in most of Europe, then Judaism is not too far from you, which means that if you skip the shul, you're skipping the fire. You're not doing good for yourself. You're not valuing the Torah like it's Torah. You're looking at the the Torah, you're looking at the shul as if it's like a movie. Le'avdil. Oh yeah, it was really entertaining. What a good shiur. What was it about? I don't know. It was just so it was funny. It was good. He made some jokes. He, he said some funny stuff. Yeah, he said some good stuff. Why did he say it's good stuff? I don't remember really what he said, but it was good. It was good. People always ask me, how come you have all these little flags in your books? You know, somebody saw my Tanakh one time. I brought it to, my, to the shul. 
think I wanted to do, he asked me to give a speech or something. And uh, yeah, yeah, it was a, uh, give me a shield. And asked me, they looked at all these little red, those little green things. He's like, what is that? And he started looking, he took the book, started looking at it. Said, wow, dude, everything means something. He made a big deal out of it. And people usually see my books, they make a big deal out of it. They make you think like I'm some chacham. What does it actually mean, all these notes? What does it mean, all these notes? What does it mean, all these little flags? You know what it means? Does it mean I'm a chacham? Absolutely not. Anybody can make notes. Anybody. What does it mean, these notes? What does it mean, these little flags? It means I care. I care enough about what's on that page that I want to make sure I remember it. That's all it means. It means that it's valuable enough for me to make sure that I don't forget it. That's all it means. When I tell you guys to bring a notebook and write down what we say in the shiul, I'm not telling you to write, to write down a notebook because I'm going to test you at the end of the shiul or once a month. This is not school. You're not in high school and you're not going to get graded. You're only getting graded in Shemaim. The point is, if you're going to be a Talmud, you'll see from this Mishnah, the first and foremost important thing is to realize you're supposed to be a Talmud. A Talmud, by definition, cares about what he's learning. He's looking to learn. But if you're just going to come, or you're going to watch online, at your leisure, on the couch with the potato chips and the beer, and it's going to be fun, but you're not going to remember anything that I said, and you're not going to take any notes, then you're missing out. You're missing out most of the schal, you're missing out most of the mitzvah, you're missing out on the bigger reward. You're missing out on everything. You're wasting your time. You're already here for three hours. Now, I'm not saying you have to write down everything I say. What I am saying is that I speak for three hours, on the average two to three hours. Take one point. Do I make one point? Everybody agrees here that during three hours I make at least one decent point. One point. I'm not saying all three hours are good. One point, uh, average at least one point per shoe. Anybody here disagree? There's not that many of you today. Anybody here disagree that there's at least, you don't have to, no busha. Admit, no busha. You don't have to uh, agree with me. If you disagree, it's fine. But, I mean, you keep coming to the show, I'm assuming you like it. Is at least one decent point in three hours? I'm not including the other two hours after the show that you guys asked me questions that should have been in the show. I'm talking about during the show, during the recording time. Is at least one decent point? One decent point there is, right? But Salem, you agree? But Salem knows. Okay, but Salem comes to show him. Okay. One point, yes. Write down that one point. Don't write down the whole show. Hush for some, two. Don't write the whole show. You're going to ruin the whole show. Everybody wants you to give a show now. I need a job. One point. Write down one point. Take a little notebook. Take a little post-it. Take a little something. Put it in a book. Write down one point. One point. Take it home. Do it. Think about it. Remember it. Do something with it. That's your schal. That's your reward. That's the point of going to the shul. Because if you're just going to keep going and watching shurim online, in person, and so on, and you didn't even write down a single point, it's almost like it never happened. You're still getting a reward in Shemaim for attending, but you're not going to get a reward for doing because you're not going to do it because you forgot. You forgot the point. A day, two days, three days, four days later, you forgot the point. Once you forgot the point, you can't do it. Finished. But if you have a little notebook, you write down the point, you go over it every week, you go over your points, before you know it, you wrote a book. So the first and foremost that we see today is that most people don't want to be Talmidim. They want to be Morim. They want to give you Chidushim. They want to tell you stuff. They want to say stuff. They want to get themselves heard. And it's nice. It's nice to be heard. But if that's all you're looking for, you're only looking to be heard and not learn, you're missing the point. You're missing the point. So here, this Mishnah is telling us, first and foremost, if Hashem gave you the talent, the gift, if you will, of understanding things quickly, don't waste it. Don't waste that gift. If you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth, don't waste that gift. There's plenty of people that don't understand it. 
I'm telling you, I talk to some people, sometimes I'll talk to them for an hour in hopes maybe in the, they understand one minute. Not everybody is going to understand. You say in Tehilim, the fool is not going to understand this. There's certain people that are fools that are not going to understand. But that's okay. They understand one point, that's all we need. One point, we start doing tshuva. But if you have the gift that you, stu- you understood the whole a half hour out of the hour, you understood the whole hour, but you didn't go over it, you didn't write down a point, two points, three points, five points, ten points, you're a big exceed. You're a bigger fool. Why? You're wasting your talent. And that's why it says that Yetzas Charobe Efsedo. Because he has this gift, he lost. Why? Hashem gave him a gift. He didn't use it properly. And because of that, he forgot to develop his learning skills. He forgot to develop his midot, his appreciation of what Hashem gave him. And that's why you see sometimes young kids that are born gifted, mentally gifted, later on in life they fall behind. They're born gifted. They have a high IQ. They're advanced. But in many cases, it's not one or two, three, three, three times. Many cases, you can even say most, like a majority, more than 50%, they fall behind. Why do they fall behind? Because they remember quickly, because they understand quickly, they forget to develop their learning skills, they forget to develop their studying skills, they forget that the Torah is something that you have to toil, you have to work hard for it. Even if Hashem gave you an extraordinary brain where you remember stuff, unless you learn how to learn, and how to learn hard, and how to make sure that you go over things, understand things, appreciate things, even if you remember it, it will become meaningless to you. There's one guy that, Hashem Yachem, he knows a lot of stuff. He knows a lot of Torah, and his hobby, his hobby is to learn Gemara. His hobby is to learn Gemara. He's been learning Gemara his whole life. But he learns Gemara on Shabbat smoking cigarettes. While he's smoking a cigarette, he's learning Gemara. Now you ask him anything, he'll tell you, yeah, yeah, it's on page this, it's on page this, it's on page this, Gemara this, Gemara this, Gemara this. Why are you smoking a cigarette on Shabbat? Why? I mean, it's intellectual stimulation. It means nothing to him. So even the person that still has the brain... As no yirat shamayim. No yirat shamayim, the chokhmah doesn't mean anything to you. The Torah doesn't mean anything to you. On the other hand, if you didn't learn how to develop your concentration, your study habits, then eventually the original skill, the original gift that Hashem gave you as a kid just becomes old. Like it has rust on it. And everybody else catches up because their brain continues to develop as they're working hard. Their brain develops. And all of a sudden, the guy that was behind you by two grades is in the same level as you. And as time goes on, he's higher than you. Why? He worked hard. And I told you guys the stories last week. We're not going to go over them again. How there was these kids. I had a few of these kids. And my school would drive me crazy. Even though I was in advanced classes, there was a few kids in the class that were even more advanced. And it would drive me crazy because it seems like they never studied. They would all study, like three of them. They would literally all study like 30 seconds before the test and still get the best grades in the class. It drives me crazy. But over time, that skill didn't help them. Over time, that skill actually hurt them. And the hard workers in the class actually made something of themselves. So first and foremost, the Mishnah is telling us the first type of student that gets the gift but doesn't use it right, it could actually become a loss. It could actually become a bad thing for him, not a good thing for him. The next thing that we went over is one who grasps slowly and forgets slowly. His loss is offset by his gain. So this is a person that it takes him a while to learn things. But once he has it, it's like a memory bank. He has a brain that's a memory bank. He's not going to forget it easily. 
It'll take a while. He has a takes him a while to get the point. Takes him a while. But once he gets it, he gets it. Here it says that his loss is offset by his gain. The fact that it takes him a while to understand the point is not a good thing. It's not a good thing. But it's a great thing that he remembers it. So whatever loss he has, the fact that he has to toil a little more than the average person is a benefit out of it. Why? Because once he gets it, he gets it. So here we see that Hashem gives people different types of gifts. Different types of gifts. Now, Rabbeinu Yonah says that if there's such a situation in the world where there's poverty, there's poverty in a Jewish world, and there's not much money to be given to Talmidei Torah, who are you going to invest in? You're going to invest into the people that are extra talented? Are you going to invest in the people that have a memory where they come, they understand everything, but, uh, you know, they forget everything right away? Or they take a while to learn, but they remember. Who do you invest in? Rabbi Yonah says, when there's limited funds available to support Torah students, the priority should be given to one who has a poor grasp on things but a strong memory over a quick-minded individual who doesn't retain well. And the reason why is because the student with the good memory, the second one in our Mishnah, has a better chance to succeed in his own learning and eventually become a teacher, eventually become a rabbi. The fact that it takes him a while to learn, okay, it's not great, but whatever he's going to learn, he's going to take on. This is good. We'll take him. We'll support him. Much more than the guy in the first option. Now, in today's world, money is not a problem. Baruch Hashem, the Jewish world today is very, very wealthy, with the exception of the times of the Bet HaMikdash, Lama Melech, when there was gold in the streets. I think today qualifies as one of the best times in the history of Am Yisrael as far as money is concerned. As far as religiosity is concerned, as far as Torah is concerned, Hashem Yerachem, we are probably in the worst time that we've ever been in. When you hear news every day of what's happening in a Jewish world, I always tell you guys, every day my Rav and I debate, did we get to the 50th level of Tumah or no? Because the Oa Chaim HaKadosh said that Am Yisrael reached the 49th level of Tumah in Egypt. And Hashem had to take them out of Egypt at that moment, or else they would make one more sin, and He can't, uh, he can't take them out. But before Mashiach comes, we're going to get to the 50th level. So the Chachamim asked, well, how can He take us out of the 50th level now, and not in Egypt? He says, because now we have Torah. We have Torah. Back then we didn't have Torah. In Egypt we didn't have Torah yet. Which means we're going to get to a worse level than where we were in Egypt. In Egypt, there were idol worshippers. In Egypt, we didn't do such good things. We looked apart. We dressed better than we do today. You didn't see anyone walking around half naked. You didn't see anyone walking around with mini skirts and tank tops. You didn't see any mixed weddings. Everybody said, no, no, come, come, fulfill a mitzvah. What's a mitzvah? Come, come to the mixed, we- mixed wedding, mixed dancing wedding. What mitzvah? For the Satan? What mitzvah is this? Going to weddings with mixed dancing. It's Arek Ve'al Yavo. It's better to die and not go to a mixed dance wedding. Mixed dance uh, bar mitzvah, bat mitzvah. But people are going and sometimes they invite the rabbis. And the rabbis, miskenim, what do they do if they're, if, they're, if they're decent people? I'm not talking about the Erev Rav. I'm talking about decent human beings. I'm not talking about the Reform and the Conservative that are dancing with the people. Somebody sent me a, uh, a profile of an Orthodox rabbi in Canada. Orthodox. He calls himself Orthodox. Both of them have uh, signed up to be uh, in the show Dancing with the Stars. I'm dead serious. I'm not, I can't make, you can't make this stuff up. You can look this up. The rabbi and the rabbanit, with the wig up to the floor, they both signed up and got accepted to be in the show Dancing with the Stars. The Chilul Hashem, 
that's happening in there, I would be surprised if the building doesn't collapse. The rabbi that calls himself Orthodox on the, on the, on the website says Orthodox Keila. Orthodox Keila, we are in Dancing with the Stars. We, me and the Rabbanit, nonetheless, are going to dance not only in public, but in front of the whole world. Make sure that if it's a Chilu Hashem, it's all the way to the end. You have this. You have the uh, reforms in Boca Raton that we can't talk enough about. That uh, want to bring up Krishna, dying to bring the Christian missionaries back to the shul. Every few months they bring the guys from, uh, from APAC and from uh, the Jewish Federation that are Christians. They don't bring the Jews from there. They bring the Christians. And you look at the bios of the Christians that speak there. They're all missionaries. The evangelical Christians, by definition, are the biggest missionaries in all of Christianity. By the way, in order for you to be a Christian, you have to be a missionary. It's not like it's a, uh, it's like you have a choice. It's like if you're a Jew, you have to learn Torah. If you don't learn Torah, you can't really be a Jew. Why? Because you're not going to know how to be a Jew. So we have this, and then on Shem Echem, we have other terrible news. One of the grandsons of the former Gdol Adol just married a man. He divorced his wife and kids and married a man. This is just a few days. This is not like a... Uh, so I, I, we argue, we argue. This is 50. It has to be. has to be the 50th level of Tumah. has to be. has to be the 50th level of Tumah. How much worse is it going to get? The terrorists are beating, they're beating the Israelis with kites, with $5 kites. We're seeing Hashem. Obviously, Hashem is upset here. Hashem is angry here. $5 kites is beating uh, the uh, billion-dollar uh, missile system we have. Something's wrong. There's something wrong. But no. People think, no, everything is fine. It's just certain sections, certain people, certain this. We're all sleeping. And that's why Rabotai, I think that we are in a generation, not only of the Mashiach, but also fulfilling of the Nevoah. The Nevoah that the Chachamim told us that before the Mashiach comes, he's only going to come for a generation of righteous or a generation of wicked. So the Chachamim obviously have said, listen, it's not possible for everyone to be righteous. Everyone tzaddikim. And it's not possible for everybody to be reshaim. There's always going to be some tzaddik. There's always going to be some rasha. He says, no, that's not what it means. What's the pshat? The pshat here, the simple meaning here, is that before Mashiach comes, everyone is going to have to make a choice. Are you a Jew like Moshe Rabbeinu? Or are you like Bilam? Pick a choice. Which one do you want to be like? If you want to be a Talmud, then you have to start getting yourself a notebook. Then you have to start getting yourself a kippah. Then you have to start getting yourself tefillin. You have to start looking like a Jew, acting like a Jew. Stop going to uh, these mixed weddings, these mixed parties. Stop acting like a goy. Stop wanting to be like them. Stop wearing clothes like them. Every, every, every other day I see a new speaker, a new speaker, public speaker going to tell people Divre Torah with tights on. They wear clothes like it's a second pair of skin. This is a person that's teaching Torah today, Hashem Echem. One guy wore leopard, a leopard outfit. A leopard outfit, he's saying, he's, he's, he's quoting things, but he's wearing a leopard outfit. Leopard, you know what leopard is? Leopard is what, you know, the, the Russian women from the 1930s used to wear, I think. A guy is wearing this with a kippah on, but he has a leopard outfit. It's a kaparat abonot for me that I have to see this stuff. What can I do? So, you have to understand, Rabotai, right now you have to make a choice. You have to make a choice if you want to be a Chacham. And I don't mean a Chacham, you become a Talmud Chacham overnight. No, I mean a Chacham is being, taking advantage of the gift that Hashem gave you by making you a Jew. You have to pick a choice. So the first one, wasted his, wasted his gift. The second one, took advantage of it. Now we move on. There's another person, one who grasps quickly, he gets the information quickly, and he forgets slowly. He has both good parts. And that's why the Mishnah says, Ze chelek tov. 
And there's another, uh, some texts say that this is Zechacham. This is a Talmid Chacham. This is a person that's going to become Talmid Chacham. So everyone wants to be this guy. Everyone wants to be the one that understands the whole shiul and remembers everything. And he's going to be the one that everyone listens to because he remembers everything. But the reality is it's not so simple. It's not so simple to get this gift. The Levarier, about 400 years ago, says that there's not a person on earth who doesn't want a good memory. Every person wants a good memory. Every person with, that's a normal person wants a good memory. Why? Because it's such a useful tool that you can use in anything. And he names, I mentioned this to you guys last week, he names a few people throughout history who had exceptional memories. He mentions Koresh, Koresh, the king Koresh of Paras. He says he knew the name of every single one of his soldiers. Every single one of the soldiers. Some of us forget the names of our kids. He knew the names of every single one of his thousands and thousands of soldiers. He knew the names. And who they were, and what, and we, everything. Unbelievable memory. Julius Caesar was, had such a memory, such a brain, that he was able to write, write a book on seven different topics simultaneously, meaning he's writing seven different books at the same time. Seven different books, seven notebooks, and he's, let's say there's seven people, seven scribes, seven people that are writing what he says. And he says to the first one, okay, right, uh, do, 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 I killed 800 people. Okay, second one, uh, about the zoo. Third one, about the chimpanzees. Fourth one, about, uh, I don't know, whatever. Seven different topics simultaneously. And the Levalier says, he also never forgot a single thing he ever learned. One thing, he never forget. Nothing, he never forgot anything. Such a brain. And he said, and these people, as sharp as they were, as brainiacs as they were, they weren't even considered a zvuv, a zvuv, a fly. A fly in comparison to any of our Talmidei Chachamim. Why? Because the level of Chochmah of a real Talmid Chacham is more than just remembering stuff. The Torah is not just about remembering stuff. The Gemara in Masechet Shabbat says it's something extraordinary if you understand it. There's a machloket here, Masechet Shabbat, page 106b. There's a debate. A debate of what is considered a trapped animal. A trapped animal. Is a trapped animal an animal that is in a cage that's small? Or is it also considered trapped if it's in a big place, like a big yard? But it's gated. Is it trapped because it has a place to hide? Is it trapped because it's just big? And so on. So the debate continues for a couple of the peem. And then, Rav Yosef says that Allah is like Rabban Gamliel, who says that not all of the enclosures are the same. There's different types. It all depends on what's in it. It's not so simple. It's not so simple as far as big one or small one. So we're not going to go into the whole sugya, but the point is, is that Abaye, Abaye comes to, to Rav Yosef, he says, wait a minute, why are you throwing in Rabban Gamliel? Because there is a rule in the Gemara that Allah goes like Rabban Gamliel. Anything, there's a certain debate. If Rabban Gamliel gets involved, whatever he says, that's Allah. A certain Chachamim that Allah goes like them. 
says, but yeah, but Rabban Gamliel wasn't even involved here. Here we had two opinions. And what Rabban Gamliel, what you're saying that Rabban Gamliel said, is what the Chachamim said. The debate was between Rabbi Yehuda and the, and the rest of the sages. Rabbi Yehuda next to the rest of the sages. So he says, Allah is like Rabban Gamliel, which agrees with the sages. He says, why are you mentioning Rabban Gamliel? Mention the sages. Allah goes, like the sages said, why are you just uh, saying it in the name of Rabban Gamliel? So Rav Yosef says, my nafkamina. What's, what's the difference to you, what I say? What difference to you if I say it in the name of Rabban Gamliel or if I say it in the name of the sages? It's the same answer, no? Same thing. Doesn't change the Allah. Allah is the same. So Abaye gives him a line that if you understand it, you deserve a million dollars. Shem will pay you. If you understand it. If you understand it, let me understand what I say, the words that I say as far as the context. Understand the significance of it. Abaye says to him, are you telling me to learn the tradition for no purpose? That it's like, uh, it should be learned like a song? Are you telling me that I'm just going to learn the Torah like it's some song? I'm just going to remember it by heart? Oh, allowed, not allowed. Allowed, not allowed. Allowed, not allowed. That's it? I'm not going to learn how they got to it? I'm not going to learn who said it? And why? And who? And what? I'm just going to learn it allowed, not allowed. I'm like, like, it's a song. You know, people, they hear a song a few times, they remember it by heart. I saw this guy just actually yesterday. Yesterday, I was thinking, how am I going to connect it to the Shiva? She had the Ishmael. I saw this guy, and I see this all the time. I don't know why I see all these things. I barely ever go outside, but I always see these un- un- unusual things. For some reason, people think that they're on a music video all the time. They think that there's like a camera. I mean, again, there is a camera in Shemaim following them. There's a camera in Shemaim following them. But this guy was walking around, and he had, uh, I had headphones on. And I was driving, and it was a traffic light. And I saw the guy walking, and he's like this. And he's doing like he's he's rapping or something. He's singing with the thing, and he's like he's like he's like making poses as if there's like a camera, and he's gonna be on some video. And I'm thinking, Shemachem, what happened to people? Like this is this is what he thinks is important. He actually probably heard this song five thousand times to remember it by heart, so he could say it and rap in the middle of the street. And he thinks that maybe Hollywood's gonna spot him. Hey, this guy, he's the next guy. Put him on TV right now. Put him on TV right now. He knows the song that this guy said on a three-minute song that has eight words you know, in total. He knows it by heart. Put him on TV. Give him a house. Give him a car. Like This is what's important to people today. This is what's important to people today. And he's rapping in the middle of the street, and he thinks like, yeah, wow, he's, 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 like, he's good. I'm dying. Baruch Shalom Hassan Goy is what you're supposed to say. Not about him, about the guy he's listening to. The one that has the $10 million. We're not supposed to learn Torah like it's a song. We're not supposed to learn aloud, not aloud. We're supposed to learn the who, the what, the where, the when. And the reason why is because if you only learn aloud, not aloud, you're taking out the heart of the Torah. You're taking out the heart of the Torah and it's just going to become meaningless text to you. It's going to be like studying history, Hashem Yerachem. It's going to be just some basic stuff. It's not going to mean anything to you. It's not going to run your life. You're not going to use it as a rule book for your life. You're going to use it as something that, if it applies, good. If it doesn't apply, good. Like somebody asked me today, he's like, listen, I know this tshuva stuff is good for you and everything, but is it really something that could heal? Is like Hashem really going to like heal me? Or is just the tshuva going to make me feel so good that I'm not going to feel so bad about being sick? Is, is Hashem really going to like solve my problems? Like I'm going to be okay? Or I'm just going to be, oh, I'm still going to be miserable, but at least I'll, I'll, I'll remember a few stories about Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. Meaning people think that the Torah is just another subject, Hashem and Hashem. And they treat it as such. They treat it like a song. And this is exactly what the Gemara in Masechet Shabbat, page 106b, is saying. Don't ever do such a thing. Don't ever do such a thing. Because treating the Torah with just yes or no, and learning just yes or no, 
that's not the point of the Torah. That's not the type of Torah that's going to change your life. It's just stuff, like anything else. And that's actually the reason why you see so much Chilul Hashem in the world from people that should know better. Whether it's the rabbi that just joined the uh, uh, Dancing with the Stars, or the one that wants to invite a uh, missionary to a shul, or the uh, other Toivat Hashem that I tell you about every week, unfortunately, that every week there's new ones. That's the difference. The difference is when a person does not have Yirat Shamayim, he doesn't have Yirat Shamayim, he doesn't apply the Torah to his, to his real life, he's not going to get a Yirat Shamayim. So meaning, it's just going to be stuff, stuff that he knows, things that he knows. It's like what I know about Wall Street. Stuff that I know, it doesn't change anything. It doesn't mean anything. It's not going to change my life in any way. Knowing the financial statement of different companies and how to analyze it and who's the CEO and what a merger is and what a stock split is, it's just stuff you know. It doesn't mean anything. In real life, it doesn't mean anything. If somebody, Shem Echem, got cancer, he's not going to say, you know what, but I really, I'm really good at knowing and understanding stock splits. You know, I really know if, if it's a reverse stock split, it's actually bad for the stock usually. Stock goes down by 12% typically. The guy just got a cancer. He's not going to say, you know what, this is going to be really valuable information for me. He's not going to think about that. What is he going to think about? He's going to think about what kind of Torah do I have? What kind of rules do I have that I can apply to this specific situation? So the person that has the memory and applies it well is going to be able to inherit Torah. Now the Gemara in Masechet Nedarim, page 81a, says that when you're talking about poverty, most people, you say this person is poor. Ze'ani, person is poor. Most people think that when you talk about ani, talk about poor, you don't have to have any money. Somebody doesn't have any money. And the Gemara says, Izaru bibne aniim shemem tetzei Torah. Be cautious with the sons of the poor, because from there is where the Torah is going to come from. So the Chachamim ask, "What is it? It's unfair." Why well, anyone that doesn't have any money, that's where the Torah is going to come from. A rich person can't have any Torah. But that's a, it's a kushia, that's a, it's a little bit of a complication here. Why? We have several, not only millionaires, billionaires in the history of Am Yisrael that were the biggest giants. Rabbi Yudha Nasi. Rabbi Yudha Nasi, Kodesh Kodeshim, was extremely wealthy. Hundreds of horses came from the Rabban Gamliel family, and the Chachamim all talked about it, they said, if Mashiach comes in our generation, it's him. It's Rebbe. Not Rebbe Lubavitch Rebbe. Rebbe Rabbi Yudanasi from 2,000 years ago. It's Rabbi Yudanasi. Mashiach, why? He's the perfect human being. He's perfected his Midot. He's perfected his Chokhmah. He's perfected his Kedusha. He's Kodesh Kodeshim, this person. He was very rich. On the other hand, you also have Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva, even though in the beginning of his life he was very, very poor, later on he inherited three types of wealth. Three, he had his wealth came from three different places. He became very, very rich. Moshe Rabenu. Moshe Rabenu also had an enormous amount of money. Also was extremely wealthy. Hashem told him to take the little tiny pieces, little tiny remains from the Luchot Ablit. When the Luchot Ablit broke, there were tiny little pieces, not the Luchot themselves, tiny little pieces that break off. You know, when you break glass, let's say you break a big piece of glass into two, right? You can have the, let's say, two big pieces, but there's always going to be little shards of glass, tiny little shards. So from the Luchot Abrid, Hashem said, the Midrash says, hey, take those two, those little pieces, hey, you can do what you want with them. You can sell them, make money from them, and so on. He became very wealthy from that. 
Not that it mattered to him, but the point is that he had plenty of money. Doesn't mean that Chokhmah didn't come from him. So what does this Mishnah actually say? What does this, what does this Gemara say over here? Be careful from the sons of the poor. So Rabbi Fahim says exactly what the Gemara is here is trying to tell you is that there's no such thing as a poor person other than what a poor person of knowledge. Poverty in knowledge. Poverty, what's knowledge? Chokhmah, meaning Torah. Poverty is not referring to poverty in money. Poverty is talking about poverty in Chokhmah, in Torah. If you don't have Torah, you're as poor as it gets. It doesn't matter how much money is in your bank. Somebody came to, I believe it was Rav Moshe Feinstein, Rav Shalom. A couple came to them. Said, Kvod Arav, we're having a machloket. A couple's having a machloket. What's the machloket? Says, I want to get, the wife says, I want to get a brand new car. And uh, it's time, our car is really old already. I want to get a brand new car. And him, he's, uh, he doesn't want to get it. So he asked the husband, he goes, why, you don't have the money? He goes, no, no, Baruch Hashem, we have plenty of money. Oh, so why don't you get the car? He goes, ah, because Kvod Arav, I'm uh, scared of uh, Ayn Ara. So the Rav says to him, uh, the Shas, the Shas, the Gemara and Shas, you, you, how many times you complete it? He says, Kudarav, no, not tell me, I didn't, finish, I didn't finish the Shas. So how many parts of the Shas did you finish? How many parts of the Shas did you finish? He goes, no, no, Kudarav, I, I, don't, I don't know parts of the Shas. He says, no, no, okay, so, Masechet, Masechet, one Masechet, one, one of these books, one of these books, how many you have one of these books? Which one do you know? I can test you on. He goes, no, no, for the Rav. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know the Masechet. He goes, Daf, Daf, one page, one page. Which page do you know? Which page do you know that I can test you on? I can ask you questions on? He says, no, for the Rav. With the black keeper and everything. No, for the Rav. I'm sorry, I don't, I, don't, I, don't know, I don't know the, I don't know the Daf by heart. He goes, ah, don't worry, buy the car. No one's going to be jealous of you. Why is he saying to him, no one's going to be jealous of you? What are they going to be jealous of? You have no Torah, you're as poor as it gets. You're as poor as it gets. You're homeless in Torah. What are they going to be jealous of your car? Who cares about the car in the house? Who cares about the car in the house? Who cares about the car in the house? That's the problem, Rabotai. We still think the car in the house means something. We still think that the, the watch with the movement means something. We still think a stock portfolio means something. We still think that wearing certain outfits, if you have Gucci, Schmucci, this G, this, the, all these different firmo, these different styles, that means something. But every single day you wake up in the morning and it says, Baruch Shelo Asani Goy. Thank you for not making me a Goy. But then you act like one. What happened? Why are you saying the blessing? Why are you lying to Hashem? Why are you lying to Hashem first thing in the morning? Why are you lying to Hashem? Don't even say it. Stop saying it then. Why are you saying it if you're a liar? Why, if you want to be a goy, why are you saying to Hashem, thank you for not making me a goy? If your clothes are a second layer of skin, they're so tight, that you want, you want everybody to know what the definition of your body is, because you want to look like everybody else that's stylish, the, 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 uh, the rappers and the hip-hop artists. You want to look like them. So why do you say, Bosh Allah, Sani Goy? If your whole life is revolved around material and money and empty of Torah, why do you say, Baruch Shalom Asani Goy? Why? You're lying. And that's how you start your day. So, Rabotai, the student is supposed to take advantage of these gifts that Hashem gave him and understand. Da'at kanita ma chasarta. Da'at chasarta ma kanita. En ani ela bedat. The Gemara in Masechet Nedarim, page 41a, says, If you got chokhmah, what are you missing? You got Torah. You got the wisdom of Torah. What are you missing, really? If you don't have Torah, what do you really have? 
If you have Torah, what are you missing? If you don't have Torah, what do you actually have? Because there's no such thing as poverty other than the poverty of wisdom. And what is wisdom? Torah. Why? That's the rules to the game. You call life. If you don't know the rules, how can you even imagine that you're going to play the right way? How can you imagine you're going to play the right way? Now Hashem gave you a gift and He said, listen, you're going to be able to learn quickly. You're going to be able to retain the information too. So what do we do? Instead of using this talent to become Talmidei Chachamim, we go and join the world of the Goim. We try to become Wall Street stars like I used to be. We try to be mathematicians. We try to be piano stars. We try to be violin stars. Okay, great. All those things are great. But what about Torah? When does the Torah come into your life? Fine, go be a violinist and a pianist and a Wall Street. Fine, it's all good. You you have to make a living, I understand. We're not in Mount Sinai right now. We're not in the desert, I understand. But when does the Torah come in? At what point? At what point does that come in? And that's the difference. The difference is, if Torah is a priority in your life, then you use the Torah also as an instruction set to apply on Wall Street, to apply in a piano, to apply on the violin, to apply at any marketing job that you have or anything. The Torah is an instruction set everywhere in your life, from the minute you wake up until the minute you go to sleep and everything in between. You're only going to know how to work and how to be productive at work, not because you listen to some self, uh, self-help guru. You don't need Tony Robbins or anyone that pretends to be like him or any of these other Zig Ziglar's or these uh, salespeople that can coaches that come to tell people. All you need to know is what does the Torah say? What does the Torah say? Torah says that if you work for somebody and he's paying you, you're not allowed to steal from him. That means that every single minute you're at work and you're getting paid, you must work. So if you're already there, work and you'll be productive. You don't need Tony, Tony uh, Robbins to tell you to go work. The Torah tells you to go work. And if you're not going to work, why do you work there? If you're going to steal, go steal more things. Go steal a bank at least. You're going to get more money. If you're going to be a thief, why are you stealing only 100 bucks a day? Go steal, go back, go rob a bank. Either way, in Shemaim, you're a thief. The Torah teaches you every single one of the rules that you need for everything for your job, for your marriage, for everything. That's applying to what your life. And that's the gift that a person can have to not only learn these things, but also remember them. Remember them in order to apply them in their life. Now, the next part is the part that most people can relate to the most when they first start doing tshuva. I know I did. The fourth type of student is kashe lishmoa umayir leabed. Ze chelik ra. A person that grasps slowly and forgets quickly. This is a bad portion. In so many words, it feels like a curse. Not only does it take you a while to understand what the guy is saying, but even after you understood it, you forgot everything. Shem yachem. Now, Arav Hutner, Allah wa shalom, said that stories that we hear sometimes about Chachamim, like the Gaon Mi Vilna, Allah Shalom. Some say he finished the Shash when he was like six or something like that, like some ridiculous age. Before we even knew Aleph Bet, he finished the Shash. I don't know the, the, the source of this story, but I'm sure it's true if, 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 that's what, if, if, it's, uh, if there's a real source to it. You hear stories about Rav Ovadia in his bio when uh, his father took him to, uh, to Iraq with him one time, to Bavel. Little Ovadia, who was 10 years old, wasn't interested in working in uh, the stores or anything. He was interested in going to learn Torah. So he said, Abba, can I, can I go to the shul to go learn? His Abba said, yeah, go, go learn, go learn your Torah. And he went to the Torah, he went to the, uh, to the shul over there, and there was a few chachamim. A few chachamim learning Torah, toiling with Torah. And uh, he was just in the corner learning. 
and a couple of them got into a debate. And they're going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And then Ovadia, little Ovadia, 10-year-old Ovadia, before he's Ovadia, he says, no, no, you're wrong. You're misunderstanding the Mishnah over there. One of the older men said, Chatzuf, rude little, uh, who are you to say something to us? The other one was uh, to me, hey, relax. Why, why, why do you, why? Tell us, Lamdin, let's see what he has to say. What does a little 10-year-old little thing have to say to us? Little Ovadia starts teaching them. And he starts telling them the entire sugiya, the entire Mishnah, the entire Gemara of that issue, explaining to them what all the Chachamim said in previous generation, the Tosfot, the Rashi, all of the commentaries, something they've never seen before. One of the people there runs out in the middle while he's talking to go get the, the, the head rabbi of the country. He was their teacher. He goes to get him. He's in a, he's in a bed dean. He goes to go, listen, something here. You have to come. You have to see this. Somebody, you just came to Bavel. So rabbi runs, comes to see this. He's expecting this uh, here, big rabbi, something. He sees a little 10 year old. Little 10 year old teaching his students. But we're talking about Mamas, like something like out of this world. How does he know all this stuff? So the rabbi asks him, Young man, how much, how much of the Mishnah you, you, you know? No, I don't know. I don't know a little bit. I only know a little bit. I only know this. Amen. Vadya, tell me, how much do you know? I just know a little bit of this Mishnah, this Mishnah. How much do you know? Okay, I know this Mishnah. I know this Masechet. I finished this Masechet. And what other Masechet did you finish? Eh, finished, let's say, one more other Masechet. One more other Masechet. Which Masechet? And he tells me the name of Masechet. The tractate. And which one else did you finish? Also, maybe also there's another one. I did also. There's another one. And which one else? Uh, you know, also another one. And this one. Before you finish, he, he finished more than half the shas. But we're not finished like us finished, like he read it superficially. Finished like he knows it by heart. Any of us that have kids, you have little books. The books for kids probably the best business in the world why the whole book is like 20 pages 20 pages and 20 words that's it each book is like each page is like three words rest of it is pictures and that's it the kid made twenty dollars so honestly how many of these parents that are watching this right now how many of them actually remember the story of the tw- of the 60 words by heart the story you remember, but the words by heart. The words, the 60 words. How many do you remember the story by heart? How many of these stories? One story you remember by heart? 60 words we know by heart. Imagine six masechtot, eight masechtot, 20 masechtot, 10 years old. So back to the original saying, Rav Hutner says, stories like this are good. But if it was up to him, he would hide them. He would hide all these stories about the Vilna Gaon, about the Ravavadyas of the world, about the people that were born with a natural talent, a special memory, a special brain. He says he would hide them. He says because for most people, it actually doesn't help them. It makes them weaker. Why? Because they can't relate to him. They're not like him. They're not like Rabbi Vadya to have such a memory or the Vilna Gaon or any of the other giants in history that had such a brain, such a gift. So say, ah, see, he was a big Chacham because he had a memory. They think he was a big Chacham because he had a memory. They think he was a big Tzaddik because he had a good memory, he had a good brain, he had a special brain. It's like, ah, I wasn't born this way, so, okay, so I guess uh, I'm out of luck. I can't be one. I don't have that kind of brain, so I can't be one. Ravudna understood, understood, this is the mistake that the Satan makes you believe. That you need to have a special brain in order to be a Chacham. That you need to have a special brain in order to be a Tzaddik. 
This is what this Mishnah, one of the things that it's trying to teach us, is that there is a person that not only it takes a while for him to learn, but after he learns, he forgets quickly. And yes, this is a bad portion. This is a bad portion. But that's where the Torah is going to come from. That's also another pirush that Rabbi Ephraim says. That's also another pirush of what the Gemara in Nedarim is actually trying to tell us. The Torah is going to come from the Aniim. The Torah is going to come from the poor people. What poor people? The people that didn't have Chokhmah to begin with. The people that didn't have the special talent. Why? Because they're going to toil and toil and toil and toil in the Torah until Hashem opens up their mind. Now what's the proof? We have plenty. The Maram, the Maram Sheikh. When he was young, if it wasn't written, I wouldn't be allowed to say it. When he was young, they made so much fun of him because of his level of IQ that they called him a pumpkin head. The Maram Sheikh, they called him a pumpkin head. Why? He said, nothing's nothing there. It's empty. Nothing there. But he understood this Mishnah. He understood, okay, he had a, he had a, he had a, a bad portion. He didn't, he didn't, he wasn't born with a gift. So what did he do? He did what every good Jew is supposed to do. He opened the books and he studied. And he forgot and he studied again. And he forgot and he studied again. And he forgot and he studied again. And again, and again, and again, and again, and again. And, again. and he never stopped. And he sacrificed his life to learn Torah. Why? Because it was important to him. Because it was important to him, more important than money, more important than women, more important than this, more important, more important than anything else. And you know what happened? He eventually became the biggest Talmud of the Khatam Sofer, the Gdolado. He became the Gdolado. But he started with a bad portion. Now, even the most irreligious people in the world, even the Goim, have heard of the Rambam. The Rambam, they have a statue of him in Washington. They say he's one of the 18 most important people that ever lived. They don't necessarily give him credit for being a big Talmud Chacham, a rabbi, and a posek of all poskim. They give him credit for being a philosopher, a mathematician, a doctor. To this day, people learn his medicine, how to keep yourself healthy, how to cure certain diseases, and so on and so forth. But we mostly recognize him for his Torah. Because if you compare his Torah to the rest of his Chokhmah, you can't compare. But the Rambam, his father was the Gdolado. His father was the biggest rabbi in the world. And his mom died. So his father's Second wife didn't treat him so well because he wasn't exactly like the other boys. He wasn't smart like them. He wasn't her son like them. He wasn't treated like, like them. And everyone called him a ksil. Everyone called him a fool. To such an extent that as big of a rabbi as his father was is that actually at some point he gave up on him. He gave up on him. And he called him the son of the butcher. Because his mom, who died, her father was a butcher. He says, you're not my son. You're, you're the son of the butcher. You're like uh, from your mom's family. Because all my other sons are chachamim. All my other sons are giants. This little boy doesn't know anything. So he called him the son of the butcher. Until the Rambam, little Rambam, little Moshe, ran away and no one cared. He ran away from the house and no one cared. Because he knew he was born with a bad portion. A brain that didn't work like everybody else's. He went to a shul. He went to the Echal. Started hugging the Sefer Torah and cried all night with the Sefer Torah. 
He says, at that moment, everything changed. He sacrificed, he cried himself to sleep with the Sefer Torah. He then went to the, uh, the Rimigash, Rav Yosef Alevi Migash, learned with him for some years, until Hashem opened up his mind to the extent of him becoming the Gedol Adol. Now, does anyone here know the names of his brothers that were so smart? No. Most people don't. You know why? Because he became the biggest. Because it didn't have to do with the gift that they got. It had to do with the toiling that he did, the sacrifice he made. And just like the Gemara says in Masechet Brachot, at the end of Masechet Brachot, Resh Lakish says, anyone that wants Torah has to be willing to sacrifice his life for it. Sacrifice his life, mamash. Really. Now, somebody came to Arav Avadia one time, one of the uh, heads of the uh, yeshivot in Israel, big Rosh Yeshiva, and asked him, Kvod Arav, how did you merit to have such a brain, such a memory, you remember th- so many things. So I go over things, I go over my limud, you're supposed to go over your Torah, you learn the page, you write some notes, you go over it again, you go over it again, and 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 again, again, forever. That's the art of being a Talmud Chacham, is to go over everything, not just doing it one time superficially. You keep going, and you learn the same Gemara. And the Rav Zev from New York says the other day, he told my father, my father told me, he learns Gemara with him every morning. Now you ask the Rav, Rav Zev, any question, the Gemara, any, anything, doesn't make a difference, Gemara, Alakha, anything, he'll tell you not only the, where it is, what page number, which Masechet, which book, which Chassid, Mamash, like it's a computer. One time I said to him, like, yeah, Kvod Rav, I wish I knew Torah like you, how much you know by heart, and so on. He goes, nah, what like me, every day I forget a few pages. Every day I forget a few pages. Every, I wish every day I remembered a few pages. Every day I forget a few pages. Like for him, it's like, it's sar, it's mamash, he's suffering. That he forgot a little bit. Every day. He studies every day. For him, it's, it's tzar. He actually is suffering for him that he forgot a little bit. Because it's a natural, your brain is going to forget. And that's what you have to keep learning, to add more information than what you're forgetting. And anyway, he tells my father when they're learning, they're about to finish Masechet Brachot, and uh, my father tells him, oh, Bezal Hashem, we'll go with the next Masechet. He goes, yeah, we have to keep going in this Masechet more and more and more. He says, until you learn this Masechet 101 times, you don't know anything. He says, until you learn anything in the Torah 101 times, you don't know anything. Alvay, we finish once. Alvay, we finish Shas. Alvay, we finish the Shukhan Aruch. Alvay, all of Am Yisrael finishes the entire Shas one time. Not a hundred one. One time. Mashiach will come in an instant. But the real Chachamim tell us, until you learned it a hundred and one times, you don't know anything. Why? Because the difference between a person that learned it a hundred times and a hundred and one times is a world of difference. A world of difference. It's not like a world of difference, like, oh yeah, maybe he knows a few more halachot by heart. No, no. We're talking about, like, this is Mars, this is Pluto. World of difference. One more time. So when the Rosh Hashiva went to Rav Avadi and he told him, Kvod Rav, how did you merit to remember all these things by heart? He says, I go over everything. He says, yes, Kvod Rav, we go over everything also. We go over everything also. We don't have your brain. And he kept insisting and insisting and insisting until Rabbi Vadya told him, you really want to know? He says, yeah, I'm asking you because I really want to know. He says, every day you say Kriyat Shema. You say Kriyat Shema and you recite verses from the Torah. When you get to the portion, portion of tzitzit, you say a verse says, "Ureitem oto uschartem et kol mitzvot Adonai." The Book of Numbers, chapter fifteen, verse thirty-nine. 
It says, and, you, and it translates, and you saw him, and you remembered all of the mitzvot of Hashem. It says, if you train your eyes, you train your eyes and your mind and your neshama and your whole being to realize that Hashem is here and you're supposed to look for Him everywhere, then you'll remember everything. Meaning, if you watch your eyes. If you watch your eyes. If you're looking at every girl that walks, if you're looking at any other woman that's not your wife, you're not going to remember the Torah. You may remember some stuff, but you're not going to become something special. Why? It says it in the Torah. Wait to Oto. Who's Oto? Hashem. You saw him, and then it says, Uschartem. And then you remember. If you saw him, then you remember. If you watch your eyes, then you remember him. Then you remember his mitzvot. You don't watch your eyes? All of your Torah is being wasted. You can learn all day, all night. You can learn 12 hours a day. You don't watch your eyes? It's all going to the garbage. This is why sometimes certain people that learn less, they learn an hour, two hours, three hours a day. Sometimes you'll see that they have much more siyat dishmaya, much more help from Hashem, much more memory, much more knowledge than people that are avrechim in kolel for 20 years. Why? Sometimes the avrech is avrech in the kolel, but is a chiloni outside. Sometimes the opposite. The point is, Rabotai, is that when it comes to learning Torah, it's not, it's not like secular knowledge. If you learn an hour of math, you'll have an hour of math. If you learn an hour of history, you'll have an hour of history. If you learn an hour of, uh, I don't know, science, you'll have an hour of science worth of knowledge. Torah is different. Hashem says, I'm the one that gives you Torah. You exert your effort, you do the Mesirut Nefesh, but I'm the one that's going to open your mind. You could learn an hour of Torah, but if you sacrifice enough for that hour, I'll open up your brain as if you learned the 10 hours. I'll open up your brain as if you learned a week. But if you learned 10 hours, but then you went and spoke like a truck driver, and you curse, and you look, and you act like you're not really a Jew anymore, then those 10 hours are not even going to be 10 hours. And Rav Ovadia was telling this to a Rosh Kolel. He wasn't telling this to a Chiloni. He wasn't telling this to a secular person who didn't know anything. Meaning that this specific mitzvah of watching your eyes is not just difficult for the secular person. It's impossible for him. He's talking to Rosh Kolel. He's talking about Tamidech Chachamim. He's saying it's applying to you more than anybody else. Why? Because you work so hard on your Torah. Why are you losing it? Why don't you remember it? There's a reason for it. What is it? You're watching your eyes. You're not watching your eyes. He says, when I was in a Bedin, I would have to handle people getting divorced, the get. And sometimes these women, they came to uh, finalize everything with the get. They weren't exactly modest. So I knew I couldn't look that way. But if I looked away, she would, be, she would feel disrespected. So I can't disrespect the Bat Israel, even though she's not acting like one. Now if I looked at her, it's a sin from the Torah. I can't. So what do I do? So I pretended like I was if I was writing everything she was saying. So I was looking down the whole time, and she was saying things. I was asking her questions without looking at her, and she was saying whatever she was saying, and I was writing stuff. And she thought I was writing everything she was saying. She felt good about it. Little did she know that all I was doing was making a drawing for my kids. And every day, whoever was the, big, the good boy or the good girl in the house got that drawing. And this story only came out after he died. His kids told the story. Rabbi Tzak told the story. He says, we always asked, Abba, Abba, when, did you have, when do you have time to draw these drawings? And he told us, the Bedin. How, did he, how could you draw the Bedin? And he told us, this is what he's doing, to watch his eyes. Why did he watch his eyes? Why did he watch his eyes? Why? Because it was important. It's no different than making a note on your little Gemara, on your Chumash. On the notebook. It's no different than writing a little note. You write the note because it's important. You make a little post-it because it's important. You take this stuff seriously because it's important. If it's not important to you, if it's just you're entertained, it's just purely for mental stimulation, then you're not going to treat it like it's important.
Now, the Gemara tells us that if somebody treats the Torah like it's important, they could literally get to such a level of being not only a Talmud Chacham, but someone with Ruch HaKodesh. Now, if somebody was born with a, with a bad portion, how could he get to Ruch HaKodesh? Now, the word bad is Ra. Resh Ein. The word Chacham is... Now, the word for a wise means is Chacham. Now, if you look at the numerical value, the gematria of the two words, Ra is 270. Chacham is 68. Chacham is 68. Rav, Ra is 270. So wise is 68. Ra is 270. If a person takes this Mishnah seriously and he acts like a Chacham, even if he was born with a bad portion, even if he was born with a bad portion, he could take the 270 minus the 68 from it and end up with 202. 202 is Rav. He could still be a rabbi. He could still become a Tamih Chacham. But that's because he understands that to become a Tamih Chacham, it doesn't have as much to do as with what skills you were born with. Rather, it has to do with how much you're willing to work for the Torah, the toilet for the Torah. Now, the Gemara in Masechet Abu Dazara says the following. In page 20b, it says, Tanu Rabbanan, V'nishmarta mikol davara, Shelo yar er adam bayom, Uv'yavo l'day tum'a balayla. The Gemara says, beware of any evil thing. What is this evil thing? Anything that you look at. Immodesty. Why? Because if you look at evil thing, this is going to teach you that you're going to have immoral thoughts at night. And then you're going to come to Become Tameh at night, meaning you're going to waste seed. Now, where does it say this? Where does it say this specific ma'ad that we've talked about in the past of how to watch your eyes? How to watch your eyes on the internet? How to watch your eyes in the street? How to watch your eyes in business? How to watch your eyes at work? And so on and so forth. Even in your own house, if you have guests. If your wife decided to bring some guests, you're not supposed to sit with them. Go to your uh, room and uh, study Torah. Go to the kolel. Don't become one of your wife's uh, you know, uh, friend's friends. This is not conducive to your life. And a good wife is not going to put her husband in that type of situation. And also, she's not going to bring any modest woman to the house. But the Gemara here is telling you, watch your eyes, because it's going to lead you to sin at night. Where is it saying this? Where is it saying this? It's saying this right before it tells you the instructions of how to get Ruch HaKodesh. Right before. It says, be careful of the Ra, be careful of the evil. Be careful of the evil. Why? Because if you have the evil, you're never going to get to Ruch HaKodesh. You're never going to get to anything, meaning. Now, how do you get to Ruch HaKodesh? Mikan Amar Rabbi Pinchas Ben Yair. Tamir, Rabbi Pinchas Ben Yair, Said, Torah mevya lide zihut. Studying Torah brings a person to heedfulness. Heedfulness meaning it's getting, once you start learning Torah, you start appreciating how difficult it is. And you start becoming much more protective of that thing you call neshama. You realize how hard it is to feel good. Most people in the world, you ask them, what's your goal in life? To be happy. What's happy? I want to feel good. What is feel good? I don't really know, but I want to feel good. 
What does feel good? Okay, if, if you're talking about something, intimacy, it lasts 30 seconds. Okay, then what? If you're talking about money, it's 30 seconds pleasure. You got a million bucks, 30 seconds pleasure. How much, how much fun can you possibly have for money? 30 seconds. Okay, so the money entered your bank account, yay. So what? The wife, okay. The kid, okay. All those things, all the material has a temporary lifetime. But if you ask somebody, what do you want to be? I want to be happy. What is happy? I want to feel good. What's good? People don't know. And the reason why they don't know is because they never felt it. They never felt good. Because real good doesn't leave. Real good feeling doesn't leave with sleep, with time, with anything. Real good stays. You wake up good, you go to sleep good, in the middle of the day it's good. Even during bad times it's good. It's always good. That's good. So when a person is looking for that good, seriously, he eventually arrives at the conclusion that the only way to arrive at this good is by working on himself spiritually. Now, unfortunately, most people in the world try to work on themselves spiritually with things outside of the Torah. They go to Buddhism, they go to Hinduism, they go to all types of strange things, worshipping cows and rats and motorcycles and, uh, and, and, and people and all types of nonsense. And then you see many of them commit suicide or steal or rob or, and really not, not only not feel good but not be good. So if you really have this good, that good means it's, it's permanent. It doesn't leave you. So when you attain this good through the learning of Torah, by fulfilling it, by learning it, you learn for two, three hours, four hours, five hours straight without a break. Four hours straight without a break. No talking, no lunch, no nothing. Go, try it once. Or maybe if you haven't done it before, try two hours. Try two hours without talking. Try learn two hours Torah from a book. Two hours without talking. Only thing you're allowed to do is go to the bathroom. See the type of good you feel after. Try four hours. Hard. If you could do it, you could do it. But once you do it for four hours, you feel like a million bucks. You do it for a few days, you're a billionaire. Do it for 90 days straight. Do at least two hours, Tani Dibu, for 90 days straight. You feel like you're an angel. You feel like you can walk on water. I'm serious. And it doesn't just leave. But you know that if you make a mistake, you, you look at a girl you're not supposed to, it's gone. That good feeling, gone. You waste seed, gone. You go against the Shem, gone. Fin- Bye. Now, at that point, you're going to feel like you just lost Ruach HaKodesh. You're going to feel like you want to die. Because it was so hard to attain it. Now, the Gemara here is saying, Rabbi Pinchas Ben Yair says that once you learn Torah, you're going to learn heedfulness. What's heedfulness? Heedfulness is the constant, the steadfast refusal to go against the Torah, to transgress Torah prohibitions. A person who's heedful, when he's presented with an opportunity to sin, he won't. Simple. He learned Torah. He understands the value of this Torah. If somebody tells him, listen, why don't we go to the bar, have a drink? He says, no. He's able to control himself. Why? Because he doesn't want to lose this feeling. This is just the beginning. Meaning, if you're still sitting regularly, you're still going to the club, you're still going to the bar, you're still going to the strip club, you still go and steal at work, you still think about money all day and all night, you're still that, you haven't even reached level one. I don't care how much Torah you learn, you're not even at level one. We are at level one right now. At level one, you stop sinning. Not, you don't stop sinning because you don't have an opportunity. You have an opportunity to sin. Your friends are still alive. The enemy is still alive. The Yetzirah is still alive. And they come to you and say, you want to come? You want to go? You want to do this? You want to do that? No. Why? I don't want to lose this feeling, this good. I don't want to, I want to lose it. I don't want to lose this good. That's level one, it says. And how do you get it from Torah? 
after you get to heedfulness, heedfulness will get a person to diligence. Zirut mevi'ali de zrizut. What's diligence? Diligence is referring to a person that's proactive with his efforts to avoid sin, meaning he's going to take certain measures, ter- certain steps to avoid sinning and not even be presented with it. Meaning, instead of being like the first guy that when his friends call him, do you want to go to the party? And he says no, he's just going to change his phone number. He's going to change his friends. He's not going to give them an opportunity to call him because they don't have his phone number anymore. He's not going to be on Facebook with his real name. If he needs, it to, if he needs to use it as a tool to do Kiruv and, and for, for his business for some reason or another, he's going to have it on a fake name. He's not going to be friends with his cousins and his classmates and, uh, oh, what is my ex-girlfriend doing? And what is my ex-boyfriend doing? He's not going to have that kind of a profile. What he's going to have? He's going to have John Smith. Who's John Smith? Completely unrelated to him. His name is David. Why? Because he doesn't want what comes with, with Facebook and social media. He just wants the tool itself. He wants the hammer. Not the damage that the hammer can cause. He takes steps to protect his neshama. To make sure that his ex-boyfriend, girlfriend, life, and so on, can't reach him. He makes sure to not go on a street that he knows has a strip club. He knows that on a certain highway, there's always going to be the same billboards. It's always going to be the same billboards. You've gone through the same highway 500 times. You know that every time you get to this portion, there's a, there's a billboard of a half a naked woman. So he knows that at that before he gets there, he knows to go all the way to the left and look to the left. So he doesn't even see in the corner of his eye what's on that billboard. One time a person told me, listen, I'm trying to do what you're telling me. I'm trying to do this stuff and not look. I almost got into a car accident. That means you're doing it right. Baruch Hashem, you almost got into a car accident. That means you're doing it right. Why? You value the Torah, you value your neshama, that you're not even willing to look at a picture. Forget about a real person. You're not even looking at a picture, that means you're going to get Torah. Trust me when I tell you, it's better to get to a car accident than to look at an imam as a woman. It's better. So a person that's diligent, that has zrizut, is already taking steps to make sure that he doesn't even have the opportunity to sin. He doesn't go on the street that he's not. He doesn't live in a neighborhood that uh, everybody's half naked. He doesn't live on the beach. He doesn't live in Manhattan. He doesn't live in Las Vegas. He doesn't live in those places. Why? Sodom and Gomorrah. Even if he doesn't want to sin, even if he doesn't want to sin, even if he wants to be a tzaddik, just by going downstairs, he knows it's guaranteed to see women in bathing suits. It's guaranteed. Even if he doesn't want to sin, it's guaranteed to see women in bathing suits. Why? He lives on a beach. What do you do on a beach? You wear a bathing suit. If you're a goy, you wear a bathing suit. Now, before you're on the beach, you're outside of the beach. So you have to walk in. So... The beach itself is not the only problem. It's the entrance too. It's the neighborhood. It's everything around it. It's everything close to it within even 10 blocks of it. You're not going to live there. You're not going to be there. You're not going to work there. There's nothing for you there. Why? It's too dangerous for my eyes. It's too dangerous for my soul. I'm not going to take the risk. It's not worth it. A person that cares enough to get to the second level is going to do those things. Now, if he wants to go further, Zrizut mevia lide nekiyut. Diligence brings a person to moral cleanliness. What's moral cleanliness? This is the attribute of being free of sin. A person that mastered the first two steps, heedfulness and diligence, will come to be free of sin. Now, this, the Mesilet Yesharim translates this as alacrity, as quickness, and says that this Nekiyut is not only a person that avoids sinning, 
but even cleanses his heart of the desire to sin. Like he doesn't even want to sin. He trains himself to become disgusted by the sin. As we talked about the Pirush on Parashat Kedoshim that Rav Vigdo Miller wrote, Allah Shalom. He says, when Hashem says Kedoshim to you, be holy because I am holy, He's not only telling you to be holy, He's telling you how to feel like Him. How to replicate Him. When He says that something is toivat Hashem, something is disgusting to Him, what He's trying to tell you is not only He's disgusted by it, He's also telling you, train yourself to become disgusted by it. How? Just like Rabbi Akiva did. Rabbi Akiva knew that to become disgusted by an imanist woman is not possible naturally. It's not possible naturally. So what did he do? When he saw a dead animal in the street, he went and he smelled a dead animal. And he was disgusting with it. He goes, that's what disgusting feels like. That's what disgusting feels like. And he forced himself to remember what disgusting feels like. Why? He says, because if I ever see a modest woman... I'm going to have to remember, this is what I'm supposed to feel like. So one time when he went to visit this king to help Am Yisrael, the king was a non-Jewish king, and he sent him two prostitutes, to think, thinking that the rabbi is like today's rabbis, the reform rabbis. So what happened? He sent him two prostitutes, and then in the morning the two prostitutes came to the king and they said, uh, your, your highness, I don't know what kind of person is this. The whole night he's throwing up in the corner. The whole night he's throwing up in the corner. So he, the, the, the king was ashamed. He's like, oh, maybe, maybe he, was, uh, he didn't like them. Maybe this. He comes to Rabbi Akiva. He goes, what happened? He didn't like them. He goes, like them. They're like two disgusting dead rats. Disgusting. I can't help it. They smell like dead rats to me. Were they really dead rats? No. According to him, probably the most beautiful woman he had. But the Rabbi Akiva, with a holy mind, he trained himself to become disgusted by it. Why? Because it's disgusting to Hashem. It's disgusting to Hashem. That is the next step when a person becomes clean, morally clean, he literally starts to train himself to clean his heart of the desire to sin. He doesn't want to sin anymore. He avoids sinning. He escapes the pull and the desire. He frees this, himself from any self-interest. He stops rationalizing all of his uh, excuses of why he should and why you know it's not. Oh, yeah, it's just um, it's just my assistant. It's just my assistant. Ah, it's just uh, my uh, my aunt. Ah, it's just uh, my ex. Ah, it's just this. Ah, it's just that. He doesn't rationalize like we do. Ah, come on, don't be... It's, ah, okay, I'm still watching. It's not that big of a deal. Relax. It's just my neighbor. She's married. I'm not going to be with her. Ah, it's, ah, blah, blah, blah. Rationalize. You rationalize your sins. There's no more rationalizing at this stage. Nekiyut Mevial le prishut. Cleanliness brings a person to asceticism. Asceticism is self-denial. A person that has this ascetic midah, gets to such a level, goes beyond the call of a duty. This is the midat chasidut. This is a person that starts refraining from even things that are allowed to him. This is a person that takes it to the next level. He wants to become... Kodesh Kodeshim, not only he's gonna he's not sinning anymore already for a while, now he's gonna stop enjoying things in life. You start lowering the joy. So, for example, he's used to eating uh, I don't know a steak every day. Now he's eating half a steak, a quarter of a steak, one bite of a steak, no steak, once a week steak. He's lowering not because he doesn't like steak anymore, because he's trying to lower his joy for materialism in this world. When people talk about the Baba Sali and all of these giants that were Kabbalists and Tamidei Chachamim and so on, 
they think it's just superficial. Oh, he was smart. Oh, he had uh, magic tricks. Like, they don't realize that every single one of these steps, they excelled in. You don't get to be them with this, without this. When they say, oh yeah, the Rav uh, Yaakov Kuli, the Baal Me'am Loez, he uh, fasted from week to week. Every time you would write the Me'am Loez, you would fast for a week, from Motzei Shabbat until Friday. For a week straight, fasting. A week straight. He wouldn't tell anybody. He only found out towards the end of his life. And this is what he would do. Why? Because he wasn't hungry for a week? He wasn't thirsty for a week? No. Because he wanted to have only Kodesh in his life for a week. So it's lowering your desires. Again, these are, it doesn't have to be such extremes. There's, I don't think there's anyone in the world today, or at least not that I know of, that could fast for a week every week. But the point is, is that this gives you an idea that if you're still trying to enjoy your, the, the next, uh, you know, you're still thinking about the next leased car or finance car or the next watch or a bigger house or a nicer kitchen or uh, you, you're, you're daydreaming about what your lunch is going to be. If your whole life is about lunch, dinner, breakfast, food, shows, materialism, we have to go to the beginning. This is step one. But... If you want to get to Waha Kodesh, this is one of the steps. I told you I'll tell you how. This is one. <clears throat> now, Prishut Meviyah Lide Tara. Purity. Asceticism brings a person to a level of purity. What is this purity? This is a person who's completely unconnected to sin, unsullied by sin. He has no sin on him. But this sin is not only spiritual, it's also morally. Being morally clean, I'll explain, I'll give you guys a story to understand what it means. Now the Mishlet, excuse me, the Mishlet Yesharim says that this purity takes the asceticism, this refraining from, from pleasures of the world, to now a level of thought. Meaning that a person who's pure not only refrains from partaking the permitted pleasures, but he starts to train his heart and his mind to even desire these things. Now, he not only is lowering himself his intake of food and sex and uh, all of the material of the world, but in addition to it, he now gets to a point where he doesn't desire it to the same level. And that's what we'll get to the Mishnah in Avot 6 6, in probably another month or so, that it talks about this 48. 48 things, 48 sacrifices, if you will, that you have to do it to become a Talmud Chacham. And you see that all 48 have to do with materialism. Lowering your material intake from the world. All the pleasures of the world. So, this purity is purity of thought, purity of actions. Now, how does this look in real life? How does it look? Rabbi Zusha, Allah Shalom, was one of the Talmidim of the Baal Shem Tov. Rabbi Zusha one time told his wife, you know, I think I have uh, some sins I have to fix for my life. My whole life I have some sins. What sins he made, who knows? Sins. He probably uh, prayed uh, Amidah only for three hours instead of uh, three and a half hours. And you'll understand why I'm saying this in a moment. So, Rabbi Zusha says to his wife, listen, I think in order to clean us up, I need to go to the exile. Like Galut. What does it mean to go to the exile? Go to America? Go to, uh, can you shut it off, please? No, you don't have to answer the phone. You can just shut it off. And uh... So now, he says to his wife, Maybe I'll go to the exile and uh, where no one knows me in homeless clothes, become a beggar for three years. No one knows he's Gdoladol. No one knows he's a giant. No one knows he's Kodesh Kodeshim. He's a beggar. He has a little pot, a little pen, a little spoon. He eats himself, doesn't nothing. Watch me, skin. Three years suffering. 
No plane, no hotel. Okay, if that's what you think, his, his wife was Kodesh. says, if that's what you think, he's going to do. Go, Chavod. So the Gdol Ador goes to the exile for three years. After three years, three years are up, he's ready to come home. He says to come home now, I, have to, I should get my, uh, he wants to get his wife a special present. She hasn't seen a husband in three years. There's no phone, there's no email, there's no text message, there's no phone in the middle of the shiul. So I'm going to get her a present. So he decides to buy her a really expensive, beautiful piece of leather that she can make a nice jacket out of. In those days, you didn't, uh, there wasn't like stores like today, you just buy the jackets all finished, they make 60,000 of them and hopefully they sell half of them. In the stores and the other half in the flea market. In those days, you just you bought the fabric and you take it to a tailor and they make it for you. <coughs> so he buys her this beautiful piece of leather to make a jacket out of. He comes home, shalom aleichem, everything is good. Wow, 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 everything's fantastic. Bo Hashem, here's the present. Because I want the Rabbani to have a really beautiful Hasidish jacket for you. Nice. So she, uh, he says, I want you to go take it to the best tailor there is in, in the entire city. Don't try to save a penny. Take two gold coins and go pay the, the best tailor out there to make yourself the most precious jacket there is. Okay. It's mitzvah to buy the wife presents. It's mitzvah to reward her for also the mesirut nefesh she does. It's mitzvah to have something special for Shabbat. It's mitzvah to look presentable. So she goes, she takes it to the best tailor. They agree. She gives, she... uh, Tells her, okay, it's going to be a month. A month later, she comes back. She sees the jacket. It's beautiful. The nicest thing she's ever seen. She tries it on. Amazing. Wow. It fits perfect. And then she notices that the tailor is sad. Sad. Like, you know, sad a little bit. So well, why are you sad? Oh, no, no. Don't worry. Don't worry. Do you like the jacket? Do you like the jacket? No, no. I just, okay, I like the jacket. But why are you sad? Why are you sad? Ah, uh, listen, I, uh, I'm a, you know, I'm a widow, and my daughter is, uh, thank you, excuse me. Yeah, thank you, excuse me. My daughter is, uh, trying to get married, and I don't have any money, and, uh, we decided within the family, my friends, family, this and that, everybody is going to get something. So she has something to, 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 you know, she has something for herself to start her life. One person is responsible for a pot, another one for a pen, another one for, for a couple of forks, another one for her shoes. I was responsible for a jacket. And the wedding's coming up, and I don't even have it. And this jacket just reminds me of my responsibility that I can't meet, that I don't know how to face my daughter, my only daughter. I can't even get her this. The Rabbanit takes off the jacket and says, give her this one. No, no, for the Rabbanit, I'm sorry I even told you. No, it's not fits for you. It's your jacket, Chas Shalom. You waited. up. No, no, no. This is her jacket. It's her jacket. Take it. She takes the jacket. Thank you. I love you. Hugs, kisses, everything is good. She comes home. So far, this is like many of the other Sipuret Tzadikim that you've heard before. They said he came, they're doing something that most people are not willing to do. What does this have to do with purity? The next part of the story. On Shabbat Eve, Rabbi Zusha goes to Beknesset, he brings his wife, and he sees that his wife is now wearing her new jacket. He says, uh, thinks to himself, she was supposed to get the jacket today. Oh, maybe because it's uh, raining, she didn't want to ruin the jacket. He doesn't know what happened. She didn't tell him. She didn't come home. Hey, honey, honey, I just, the three years you worked for, I, uh, you know, I just gave it away to somebody. She didn't say that. Look what a tzaddikah I am. She didn't say that. If you're saying, look what I did, then you're not a tzaddikah. 
So now he's wondering to himself, maybe because it's raining. The next morning, it's not raining, it's sunny. And you see, she's still not wearing a jacket. So yes, Rabbanit, Kvoda Rabbanit, where's your jacket? Where's the jacket that, that, that you bought that she was ready, that was supposed to be ready yesterday? She's not ready? He goes, no, no, it's ready. Okay, so where's the jacket? Oh, I, I gave it to her. Well, why did you give it to her? She goes, oh, I gave it. She tells him the whole story. So Bizusha says to him, but did you also give her the two gold coins? She says, no, I didn't give her the two gold coins. I gave her the jacket. She goes, no, 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 Rabbanit, no. Rabbanit. The fact that you gave her a present, that has nothing to do with anything. That's your problem. You want to give her a present, give her a present. Pre- but you still owe her the two gold coins because she worked for you for a whole month. We must make sure that Motse Shabbat, you go and you give her the gold coins. You owe her two gold coins. You're not allowed to mitzvah from You're not allowed to delay payment. You're not allowed to delay payment to your employees, to contractors. You're not allowed. It's a sin from the Torah. We must go to her and give her the two gold coins. The fact that you gave her the jacket has nothing to do with it. You decided to give her a gift. Good for you. You did a mitzvah. But it has nothing to do. You made a contract, two gold coins, you have to give her the gold coins. Now, unless you have Torah and you've reached a level of purity, this is not even a thought in your mind. Why? Because you're thinking like I'm thinking. She should say, take it, give her the jacket. What? You want to be paid for it too? She should say, take it, give her the jacket. You want me to give, pay her also? Yes. One thing has nothing to do with the other. Without a clean mind, without a pure mind, you don't think like this. You don't connect the two. You're thinking, I gave her much, something much more valuable. I gave her a jacket that's worth 10 gold coins. 100 gold coins. I have to give her the payment too. But she sold it for herself. It has nothing to do with anything. That's a pure mind. A pure mind does not connect those two. A pure mind realizes they're two separate things. So now, Tara, this purity, brings a person to chasidut, piety. Now we start understanding that chasidut of today has nothing to do with chasidut of the Torah. Why? Because piety, chasidut, real chasidut, is an attribute of one that goes beyond the letter of the law. As I've told you guys several times in the past, this is a person that serves God not even for his own benefit but purely to please and gratify the Almighty. He views Torah and Mitzvot as a starting point in his quest to discover all means by which he might be might bring gratification to his Creator. And his ultimate purpose is to become altruistic. Literally serving his creator purely for the creator's reason. We see this in the Torah when Job. Sorry if you're disgusted with the tissue. Just have a cold. A person that gets to a level of chasidut. Starts serving Hashem only for Hashem. When Job told the verse in the Torah, it says, Eyob says that even if he were to destroy me, I'd still serve him. What do you mean? If you do this mitzvah, Hashem says, you do this mitzvah, I'm going to kill you. You do this mitzvah, it's a mitzvah. I like it. But after you finish, I'm going to kill you. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to do it. Great. It's like, whoa, let me do it. How fast? I'm about to go do a mitzvah. Hashem told Moshe Rabbeinu, you know, after you go to war, this last war, that's it. It's the end of your life. Now, he didn't tell Moshe Rabbeinu, you have to go fight now. He told him, listen, this is the last war. After this war, that's it, you're finished. What did Moshe Rabbeinu do? Immediately went and started the war. Yeah, but you're going to die right after the war. So? There's nothing to do. If my God wants, to, wants me to go fight the war, he wants me to fulfill a mitzvah, he wants me to put tefillin on, he wants me to learn, he wants me to give tzedakah, he wants me to do anything, my opinion, my desires, my will is completely removed, irrelevant, insignificant. It's thrown in the garbage and never looked at again. Why? His will 
is much more significant than my will can even ever be. Moshe Rabbeinu says, the fact that I'm going to die, that's my problem. Who cares? I need to go serve my creator. That's Hasidut. Hasidut is you're not starting a Beknesset because you're going to make money out of it. Hasidut is not you're going to write a book so people recognize that you wrote a book. Or you give a lecture because people say, wow, what a chacham. Chazaku baruch. Wow, you know how many mitzvot you're getting? You don't do, you don't, this, this has nothing to do with Hasidut. If you're doing it for, for that, it's not Hasidut. Hasidut also has nothing to do with what you're wearing. Once a person gets to this Hasidut, there's a next step. Hasidut meviya li de'anava. Piety brings a person to a level of true humility. Now once a person refrains from even permitting pleasures in his own life in order to distance himself from anything forbidden, in Hasidut, he's starting to focus on positive commandments, meaning he's trying to start doing things that are not even commanded in the Torah. It's not an obligation. Like for example, you see a lot of Jews today who have beards. Beard is not written in the Torah. You don't have to wear a beard. It's not an uh, obligation in the Torah to have a beard. It's an obligation in the Torah not to shave the corners of your face and so on. But there's no obligation to wear a beard. But they call it midat chasidut. Wearing a beard is an act of chasidut that you're doing above and beyond the law. So since it's an easy way to be a chasid, you see most Jews, especially Baal Etshuvah and people that have been in for a while, wear a beard. But still, you see some serious big Tamidei Chachamim in the past and present don't have a beard. They just don't want to fulfill it, this specific midah uh, chasidut. They have no obligation. So in chasidut, you're trying to look for things that are not even obligated, but you're doing it just to fulfill the will of your Creator. Now this is going to get you to the level of humility. How? This is a person that's trying to achieve a level of perfection by looking and reflecting about his own imperfections. By reflecting on himself based on how he is next to another person, not next to a Hashem. Now sometimes you see, there's this famous story where a person was in a Beknesset crying every time during his prayer. Chatanu, avinu, pashanu. You see the guy crying, you see the guy is mamash breaking his heart to Hashem, this is the guy I want to pray next to. So, so Rabbi Levi Yitzhak bin Birdicho says, oh, this is the guy I want to sit next to on Yom Kippur, on Rosh Shana. Why? Because if I pray next to this guy, he's going to cry even more. He already cries on a regular day. He's going to cry on Yom Kippur. He's going to ho- help me cry. Why? I see him cry. He's crying to Hashem. I'm going to realize that I'm not at his level. I'm going to start crying for myself and hopefully it's going to open up my neshama that I'm going to do tshuva. So on the next time that he saw him on Yom Kippur, they give the aliyot to the Torah and uh, they give him the fourth aliyah. As soon as they tell him you have aliyah number four, he tells the Gabai Ooh, what he has on his mind. You're giving me the fourth Aliyah? Me, you're giving the fourth Aliyah? And this guy, you gave him the three, third one, and I'm getting the fourth one? You Rasha, you Tembel. And he starts cursing him and yelling at him. And ooh, 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 sewer comes out of his mouth in the Beknesset. On Yom Kippur. says to him, what happened over here? Every time I see you pray, all the time you say, Chatanu, Avinu, Pashanu, Hashem, you know, you're the best, I'm nothing, I'm nothing, Ani Afar Ve'efer, 
I'm dust and ashes, I'm dust and ashes. So what's this dust and ashes? You just said it in a prayer. He goes, yeah, I'm dust and ashes next to Hashem, but not next to this plumber. Not next to this bum. That's the problem. We think that when we say, I'm dust and ashes next to Hashem, it's a mitzvah. Like it means, of course you're dust and ashes next to Hashem. We think Hashem needs you to tell him that. Oh yeah, I'm nothing, I'm nothing next to you, Hashem. Obviously you're nothing, you're nothing next to everybody else too. That's the problem, you think you're something. Saying you're nothing in front of Hashem is not a big chokhmah. You don't need to be a uh, Tamil Chacham to know that. A donkey knows it too. The lion in the zoo, sitting over there, waiting for a piece of meat to come once a day, he also knows he's dust and ashes next to Hashem. Doesn't make him a chassid. Doesn't have Ruach HaKodesh. The monkey on the Discovery Channel, picking his uh, lice out of his head, he also knows he's dust and ashes next to Hashem. Doesn't make him a chassid. Doesn't make him a Ruach HaKodesh. When you sing your dust and ashes... When he's saying you're nothing, you're supposed to say it like the Ramban saying it that he gave it to Ramban that I read to you guys last week when he said it to his son. He said, think you're nothing next to the guy next to you. Yeah, but he's just a plumber. Yes, he's just a plumber. Maybe he's more righteous than you. Yeah, but he's so rich. Yeah, give cover to the rich. Hashem gave him a gift. Yes, maybe he has a certain mitzvah. You don't. He has a schut in Shemaim that Hashem gave him wealth. And you, he didn't. Yeah, but he's this. Yeah, everything that he has, always find a way of why he's better than you. He's more righteous than you. He's smarter than you. He's, uh, he made less sins than you. The sins that he makes is by accident. Yours are on purpose. He, and so on and so forth. That's humility, Rabotai. Humility in front of Hashem is not humility. It's just having a brain. All you need is to have a brain to qualify. Humility is when you're humble next to people. <clears throat> so when a person starts to reflect on himself in comparison to other people the right way, he starts looking for the good things in others and the flaws in himself. Not in order to become some depressed loser that he's always saying, oh, I don't have anything. No, not that. Meaning he's looking at himself and saying, I have to work on this. I have to work on this. I have to work on this. Not that I'm a loser. No. This, I'm not as good as I should be. I need to fix it. This, I'm not as good as I should be. I need to fix this. I need to fix this. I'm too angry. I'm too cheap. I'm too this. I'm too that. I have to fix these things. Motivate yourself to fix them, not to get yourself into depression. And when you look at other people, say, yeah, okay, you know what? He's not watching his eyes, but maybe it's because he has a much bigger yetzara than me. He has a much bigger yetzara than me on yetzara, but he's probably watching his breath, even though he doesn't watch his eyes. He's probably able to do it, and I can't. Oh, maybe he's really generous. Maybe this. You're looking for things that are good in them. It's the opposite of you. You, you have to work on things. Him, he already has other things that you don't know of. That's humility, at least in a brief description. One who attaches himself to God and studies his exalted ways must inevitably become aware and be ashamed by his own insignificance. Now the only way to attain this is through Torah. A person that's ignorant in Torah cannot acquire humility. It's impossible for you to become humble without Torah. Impossible. It's against nature. It's like saying, I can have babies without being a woman. Like all these guys that are changing their, their gender, thinking that they now become a woman because they decide to call themselves Stacy. They start to call themselves women names, they think that they can change their, that now they're officially women. It's the most absurd goal nefesh in existence. It is illegal, it's just no one cares about biblical law. Now, a person that is Am Aretz, doesn't know Torah, cannot become a Hasid. That's why it says in Pirkei Avot, which we learned a few months ago, actually almost a year ago now, Lo Am Aretz Hasid. An ignoramus can never become a pious person. Now, there is one specific rule 
that makes humility impossible. Meaning, you can never be humble if you do this. Even if you learn Torah, even if you uh, lower a lot of things, and you do a lot of things, and a lot of things we just talked about, if, according to the Chachamim here, if there's one thing that you do, humility becomes a distant thought. It becomes theory. Not actual. What is it? Humility is undermined by excessive attention to physical pleasures. If you're still looking to enjoy this world, you'll never attain humility. If you still care about what kind of car you drive, and what kind of watch you have, and this, and all the materialism of this world, humility unfortunately becomes a distant memory that you heard in a shield maybe sometime at one point. This is why it's absurd that sometimes that you see people talk about humility and you see the person himself talking about it is doing the exact opposite of it. The way they dress, the way they talk, five pounds of gel on their hair, you know, that they, all of these different things. Again, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not against uh, uh, modernizing yourself with the times. You don't need to be dressed like the Arabs in the Middle East right now. But there's a certain way that's classy and there's a certain way that's trashy. You're a Jew after all. And even if you're not a Jew, you're not supposed to look like you just came out of a club all the time. There's a certain way to look. There's a certain way you're supposed to be presentable. If you were going to meet Le'avdil, uh, Donald Trump, the President of the United States, are you going to go and walk around with club clothes or with a t-shirt and, and shorts to go meet Donald Trump or some other king? Because he's telling no, I'm not only going to meet you, I'm going to give you a job. I'm going to give you a job as my number one guy. You're going to make a million dollars a month. Are you going to go wear your, uh, your bathing suit to go see him? Are you going to go wear your uh, tank top to go see him? How come you wear that close to go see the king of kings, Melech Malchem Malachim, HaKadosh Baruch Hu in the Beknesset? You come to Beknesset with a tank top, with one of these basketball jerseys. I saw a uh, picture, uh, somebody uh, sent a picture of uh, young kids in a shul, all wearing tank tops. Tefillin on. Tefillin with tank tops and shorts. To sleep like that, you shouldn't. To sleep, you shouldn't sleep like that. To go put tefillin on with, with the tank top and shorts? You don't have no kavod? You don't realize Hashem is here? This Rabotai, it's just, it's time somebody said it. I know it's annoying to hear it over and over again, but it's a reality check. If it's not affecting you, it's affecting your kids. If it's not your kids, it's your neighbor's kids. It's somebody needs to hear it. Somebody needs to understand it's enough. And the problem is, when we are so connected to the materialism of the world, we are trying to become like the goyim. You want to become like the goyim, you're going to wear their clothes, you're going to wear their jerseys, you're going to wear their clothes, you're going to wear everything, you're going to act like them. And that means that you're starting off your day with a lie when you say, because you're acting like the goy. So what's the, what's the baruch part about? <coughs> I'm almost done with this part. After you get to humility, humility brings a person to fear of sin. Now initially this sounds unusual because we already thought that his fear of sin was the whole beginning of this. Fear of sin was the reason of why you started this whole journey. But here, this fear of sin, there's levels of Yirat Shemaim. There are levels of Yirat Shemaim. As you remember, I told you, the lowest level of Yirat Shemaim is Yirat Onish. You're afraid to go against Hashem simply because you're afraid He's going to punish you. Punish you by, take, by sickness, losing money, and other types of kaparat avonot, or chas v'shalom, or lamaba, losing olam haba, genom, kafakela, all of those horrible things that we've talked about in the past. That's the lowest level of yirat shamayim. That is the very basic level that Rabbi Nachman Breslov says, most people, that's all they're able to get. He says, alvay, they get that. That's what he says. Sichot Aran, beginning of the, uh, ch- uh, I think it's page 19, he says, alvay, alvay, I wish, I wish, that's what they get. Most people, he says, that's all they can get. Just 
this lowest level of fear, they're never going to get to highest level of fear or avat Hashem. It's not attainable for them. It's far, far from them. Most people, he says, including, he says, including people that are Shomai Mitzvot. Hopefully they get Yirat Shemaim that's real. Hopefully. So that's the beginning. But then there's the highest level of Yirat Shemaim is Yirat Aromimut. Fear of His Majesty. So this is not a person that's being punished for sinning. Because this is simply a common thing. This is refinement of the aspect of the chasidut, the piety that he has, that's called the Yirat HaRomimut, which when he's presented with an opportunity to sin, not only does he refrain because he fears the punishment, but now he's afraid that he's going to hurt the connection between him and Hashem Barach. Meaning it becomes sort of a marriage. A good, healthy marriage is going to have to have some fear in it. The husband is afraid of the wife, and the wife is afraid of the husband. Not afraid they're going to beat each other up. That's uh, barbarians. I'm talking about fear where he's afraid to yell at her or disrespect her, and vice versa. She's afraid to disrespect him and yell at him. Why? Because they're afraid of hurting their relationship. They're afraid that just because I yelled at him or disrespect him or whatever it is, he, the relationship is going to get hurt. He's not going to talk to me as much. He's not going to love me as much. He's not going to connect to me as much. He's not going to feel the same about me as much. Something is going to get hurt. It's like having, you know, you painted, let's say you want to paint your kitchen or your house or something, and you got the best paint most beautiful paint, you spend an extra $5 a gallon on it, and you got the best painter, you got a little Michelangelo coming to your house, painting something, and everything looks great, but then after everybody leaves, one of the kids plays with toys, la 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 la, and he takes the knife and, and you know, makes a nice mark on the wall, on your little Michelangelo painting on the wall. Now even though it's all beautiful, and it's nice, and it's wow, all you can take, all you can see is that is that little scratch over there. It's tiny, it's like this. And the wall is like this. But still, I can notice it. It's like having a wedding dress. People spend thousands and thousands of dollars on wedding dresses. Thousands, ten thousand, twenty thousand dollars on a wedding dress, something in a way one day. Now that dress for twenty five thousand. Twenty five thousand. You have dresses cost twenty five thousand, fifty thousand, even more in some cases. And that dress for twenty five thousand. How much is it worth? How much is it worth? After the groom, by accident, by accident, makes a hole with a cigarette in it. By accident. You know, he smokes a cigarette, he still hasn't quit. And he makes a hole, he's like, hey honey, how are you? And he has the jacket and he touches, and it, oh, uh, there's a hole in the dress. With the cigarette, a little cigarette. It's a tiny hole. The dress is $25,000, no? How much is the hole? Uh, you, ladies, how much is the dress? Are you going to wear the dress? 25000 with the cigarette hole? But it's $25,000 dress, no? How much is it worth now? Zero. The dress doesn't lose 99, uh, 1% of its value because it's 1% of space. 1% of space, he just lost 100% of the value. This is our mitzvot. This is our avirot. This is everything. This is Judaism. This is Torah. You could do everything perfect for 70, 80 years. If you finish your life, Oved Avodah Zarah, it's all worthless. If you finish a Mechalel Shabbat, it's all worthless. Seven years, it's all worth. It all goes in the garbage. If a person dies a Mechalel Shabbat, he has no share of the world to come. Even if he kept Shabbat for 70 years. He got rewarded in this world. If he dies a Mechalel Shabbat, he has no share of the world to come. He's considered, according to Alakha, at the end of uh, the Rambam Ilchot Shabbat, chapter 30, or Alakha 30, he's considered 100% an idolater. You're not allowed to count him on Minyan. If he, if he slaughters a cow, it's not kosher. 
if he touches your wine that's lo mevushal, it's you're not allowed to drink it. In fact, you're not even allowed to give him the cup because he's going to ruin the, the, the wine. Can't count him for minyan. Shemachem, what happens to Mechalel Shabbat in Shamaim? It's not a joke. A person dies in Mechalel Shabbat, even if he kept Shabbat for 70 years, it's worthless. So that's the thing. Rabotai, the mitzvah is not a joke. You keep this, one time you are religious, another time you're not religious. No. The $25,000 dress, one hole, it's all worthless. You have, if you read the Gemara, Masechet Sanhedrin, from page 90 all the way to 100, 10 dapim, you spend a week, two weeks, I don't know, however long it takes to read those pages, understand it, just understand it, or just read the entire book of Deuteronomy, Sefer Dvarim, with commentary from Rashi, and understand how easy it is to lose Olam Abba. And all of a sudden, you're starting to think, you know what, Kvodarav, you're not hard enough on us. You're becoming a Kerbe rabbi. How easy it is to lose Olam Abba, Hashem Echem. It's so easy. In a second, you can lose it. You know how hard you have to work for Olam Abba? One, dre- one hole ruins the dress. One hole ruins Olam Abba. You have to work hard. That's why we have to aspire to become like this. Even though we may not have the ability even to become uh, a uh, Ruha Kodesh, Navi, and so on, we have to aspire to be. Why? Because the, a Jew that continues to grow is going forward, is going to have Olam Abba. A Jew that wants to settle and comfort and everything's okay and I'm here and I'm comfortable where I'm at is a Jew that's risking his Olam Abba every second he's alive. You should start reading Tehilim for him to die. Why? Because right now he's Tzaddik. If he stays this way, he's not going to be Tzaddik forever. Why? If he's not growing, he's shrinking. That's a Jew. So now, a person that gets to this high level of Yirat Shamaim is going to have Yirat Romimut. He has this special relationship with Hashem. Yirat Achet Meviya Lide Kedusha. Fear of sin, this Yirat HaRomimut, this high level of Yirat Shamayim, brings a person to true holiness. He gets to a level of holiness. What's this holiness? Being a Ish Kadosh. This is a person that's literally glued to Hashem. He's cliv- he cleaves to Hashem as closely as human- humanly possible. To God and is just like in piety, but even in a higher level. His physicality poses no barrier whatsoever to a constant attachment to the divine. In fact, it's the opposite. He transforms the physical acts, the mundane, the day to day stuff, into holiness. In his hands, the mundane is a conduit to the divine. When he eats, eats food, he treats it as if it's literally a sacrificial offering. Now you know, when you eat, you eat food, you're not a cow. You're not supposed to just eat and leave. And also, you're not supposed to just eat, bless, quick blessing, just to get it over with, just, just as if you're doing the Shem a favor. According to the Torah, when you eat, your shulchan, your table is like a mizbeach, like you brought a korban to Hashem. A person that wants to get to the highest level has to treat birkat amazon, he has to treat birkat amazon like it's literally a meeting at the Beit HaMikdash. There's no birkat amazon, there's shh, in the middle of birkat amazon, shh, guys, guys, hold on a second, let me finish reading first. In the middle of birkat amazon. Oh, he's doing my uh, while he's praying. He's doing my while he's praying. Oh, he's walking around and he, because he knows the prayer. After you read it a few times, you know by heart. No delecha, no delecha. And he's like, you forgot. Where's no delecha? Okay, let me look at it again. He's like walking around. His mind is not there. He skips. He forgot what he ate. He's still eating. I actually went to a guy one time. I was on Shabbat. He had other guests. One of the guests was still eating during Birkat Amazon. We sat there three hours eating. He decided he wants to continue eating. When? We stopped eating for an hour. Good talk and so on. When he wants to start continue eating? During Birkat Amazon. 
during Birkat Amazon. Mamash, like, 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 see, lo yavin et zot, mamash, a fool. Doesn't understand nothing. Birkat Amazon, you're supposed to finish. You want to eat, so tell us, we want to do Birkat Amazon. But that's the thing, people don't treat it like it's something significant. They think Birkat Amazon is just like another blessing. Birkat Amazon is the most important blessing in the entire Torah. It's the only blessing in the entire Torah that actually has a verse in the Torah. Even Shema Yisrael and Amidah don't have verses in the Torah. It's a verse in the Torah. It's a it's a Yisur deoraita. It's a it's a biblical sin not to do Birkat Hamazon. Not only you're stealing from Hashem. It's not only stealing from Hashem. It's a mitzvah from the Torah. It's the number one blessing in the entire Torah. When you do Birkat Hamazon. It literally should be like, Mamash, you are at the Bet HaMikdash, you're the Kohen Gadol, Moshe Rabbeinu is here, Aaron is watching, Hashem Itbarach is there, you're doing, you're doing a blessing, like Mamash is the greatest thing in the world. You gotta get everybody to be there, they're saying Amen, every time you say Rachaman, they're saying Amen, you're fit, everybody's into it. Why? You're the Bet HaMikdash. That's the way Bechet HaMazon is supposed to be. Now this person, that got to a level of Kedusha, this is day to day. This is all the time. Every blessing is like that. He turns the simple things into Kodesh. The basic things, Kodesh. The things that we wouldn't even think of Kodesh. He turns them into Kodesh. Why? Everything he connects to Hashem. Everything. Whether it's the five minutes he's going to talk to his wife, or the ten minutes he's going to spend with his kids, or if he's going to clean himself, go to uh, in the shower, or he's going to eat a sandwich, or he's going to walk to shul, or he's going to walk home, or he's going to work, or he's going to talk to a stranger. Whatever, everything, he connects to Hashem. There's a way to connect to Hashem in everything. Even if he's walking around and he sees something extraordinary, he connects it to Hashem. Marabu ma'asecha. You did everything with, with wisdom. Look, you look at everything, creation. You look at how beautiful creation is. You see how your nails are, your eyes are, uh, trees, flowers. Imagine everything was gray. No colors. Imagine everything tasted the same. No taste. You can't imagine. Why? Because we're used to everything being delicious and beautiful and so on. When a person tries to become Ish Kodesh or Isha Kedosha, even those things, he says, wow, look, Hashem, marabu ma'asecha. Look how amazing Hashem's creation is. Look how much wisdom went into the petals of the flower. Look how much wisdom went into the tooth. The tooth. Imagine how much wisdom goes into the tooth. Have you ever seen, have you ever seen any other part of your body, any other part of your body, it's a piece of meat, a bone just come out of it, naturally? No, right? Only one part. Where? Your teeth. It's not really a bone, but in essence, a piece of hard comes out of soft. It's unbelievable if you actually look at just the, the, the lineup of your teeth. If the molars, if the molars, the ones that you have on the back, instead of being here, they would just be in the front. And the ones that are in the front go in the side. You know what it would be? You know, you would have to eat like this so the food doesn't leave your mouth, doesn't come out of your mouth. You'd have to, you'd have, to have your mouth like this. You have to look up. Because the only way you can chew is with the molars. You can't chew with the ones that are in the front. You can bite with them, but you can't chew with them. So if the front ones were on the side, they become useless. So you have to chew. So you have to chew with the front ones. Now, you can't chew with the front ones because then it's going to come out of your mouth. So you have to eat like this. You have to eat like the sheep. You become a little sheep instead of a human being. Just wisdom, wisdom you have in creation. This is what a person tries to do. He tries to look for Hashem in everything. Everything. Once a person gets to that, gets to a level of holiness, Kedusha Meviya Leruach HaKodesh. A person can get to a level of Ruach HaKodesh. Divine presence rests upon him. Ashrat HaShchina. A person who perfects himself in ways of holiness can advance to divine inspiration. This is a person... who's so holy, he's completely unaware of his otherworldly gift. Anything else that he has, if he's talented, smart, 
good looking, uh, tall, short, all of those things completely lose their meaning. He has advanced to a divine inspiration. He's aware of the holiness that rests upon him. And it's a certain level of clarity that brings the person to such a, a different world, if you will. Everything is clear. Somebody wants to come tell him something, he already knows what it is. Not only what he's telling him, what he's not telling him. When Paro came to Yosef, Yosef at Sadiq, and he wanted to tell him the uh, he wanted to tell him the dream. He tried to change the dream. Yosef told, him, "No, no, you didn't dream that. You dreamt something else." How'd you know my dream? Were you were my dream. Ruha Kodesh. Clarity. It's not just knowing stuff. It's knowing the things that are unknown. And such a person can even get to a level of resurrecting the dead, become a Tana. Like Eliyahu Navi, like Elijah the prophet, these Nevi'im, the Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, Rabbi Rabban Yochanan ben Zakai. Person that could literally look at something alive, look at something dead. One of the Talmudim, Rabbi Yochanan, heard one of his shurim when he said that uh, the Bet Mikdash will have these special doors, big doors, gold, huge, and he really had a hard time believing it. He had a hard time believing it. Now the Gemara in Yerushalmi says that a person, a person that doesn't really want, doesn't believe what the Chachamim are saying, but no, he doesn't say anything about it. doesn't say anything about it. He just thinks to himself, nah, I don't think this Midrash is real. I don't think Moshe Rabbeinu really split the ocean to 12. I don't think that uh, every Jew was, had uh, camels worth of gold when they left Mitzrayim. I don't think that, uh, you know, uh, Avraham Avinu was able to create a cow. I don't think that this Midrash is right. I don't think that Moshe Rabbeinu was 20 feet tall. I don't think the Gemara in Masechet Shabbat is right over here. I don't think this is right. Just, it's not that he goes out there and makes a YouTube video. It doesn't make a YouTube video goes against Chachamim. That person is going to be in Tzohar Watachat. But the Gemara says, a person, even for himself, he says, nah, I don't, th- I don't think this, I don't believe this one. The Gemara says, he's also going to be in Tzohar Watachat. Why? Who are you not to believe Chazal? Who are you? Bechlal. Who are you, you little you, who are you not to believe the sages? Who are you? To go against the sages, think that you're something. Your brain is something. That you're, anything is something. Mefakfek, meaning he's, he's thinking to himself. He's not even sharing it with people. He has to go to Tzohar Otachat. Do you understand the level of punishment in Shemaim? How serious it is in Shemaim? So, now... A person that has this clarity, the Swacha Kodesh, resurrect the dead. I mean, this is something special. When one of the students of Rabban Yochanan didn't really believe the story, didn't really believe the story that uh, Rabban Yochanan said that the, the, the doors of the Bet Mikdash is going to be like this, Hashem brought him to see it for himself. How? He, one day he went on a ship, and the ship crashed. The ship crashed, he got to an island, and he saw angels working on these giant doors. And he sees this, this is exactly what Rabban Yochanan described. Yes, what is this? This is exactly what he described. Wow. Later on, when he was rescued, he comes back, he goes to, back to the yeshiva, and Rabban Yochanan says something, he goes, Rav, everything you say is true. He says, why? Why are you saying that? What you said about the Bet HaMikdash, the doors, everything, I saw it with my own eyes. So what would you think? Everybody says, wow, Chazaku Baruch, you saw it. Wow. They hug him. They kill. What do you think they did? You know what happened? Rabban Yochanan says, oh, you only believed after you saw. What? Me saying it wasn't enough? 
He looked at him and he turned him into bones. Bones, bones died. What do you think? You only believe what you see? You think this is a Torah? What do you think? This is Daffy Duck? This is Bugs Bunny? It's not Torah, Rabotai. So we'll finalize with this. The Sefer Abrit by Rav Pinchas Eliyahu Mivilna. Well, I told you a little bit about it last week. When he wrote it, they actually thought that it's actually Vilna Gaon. Because also Vilna, because the amount of wisdom, the amount of kedusha that's in this book, they didn't think anybody else in the generation could write such a thing. But he has a Ma'amar, chapter 11, Perik uh, Shesh, talks about the secret of Ruach HaKodesh. And he gives all the steps, very similar to this Gemara, with slightly different details. He says, first level is kedusha. Second level is Torah. Third is getting to Ruach HaKodesh. Is the, this is the general thing. But how do you get there? What's the steps? What's the steps? So a person needs to get to a point of being, becoming holy by, first and foremost, being precise with the mitzvot. Taking every little, every big, every single mitzvah so seriously to be precise. Medaktek pa mitzvot. He's precise with the mitzvot. He's not uh, thinking, oh, this is not big enough. This is a big mitzvah. I'll specialize on this one. Small mitzvah, no big deal. No, no, no. Every mitzvah is the biggest deal in the world. Next play, next step is actually step three. Is kavana bibirkat mazon. Also talks about bibirkat mazon. Having full meaning during Birkat Amazon, full meaning during your prayers. Specifically, Birkat Amazon is mentioned here, but he also mentions other prayers. Having full kavana. The fourth is starting to study Torah Lishma. Learning Torah purely for Hashem, not because you want to become a big Talmud Chacham, not because you want to be a big rabbi. Not because you want to be a speaker. Not because you want to be famous. No. Study Torah purely for Hashem. Because Hashem said so. That's it. Even if you don't understand anything, you still study. Even if you don't remember anything, you still study. Even if it's difficult, you still study. Even if it's uh, whatever, you still study. Torah Lishma. Teach Torah Lishma. Learn Torah Lishma. The next step is morning every night in Chatzot for Yerushalayim, destruction of Yerushalayim. This is what we do, uh, Chatzot. One of the people that watches the shurim every uh, time on the shul, he says, ah, it's 12 o'clock, I have to go do Chatzot. He does it. You see a lot of these different things, people do one or two or three of them. If you do all of them, you get to Ruch HaKodesh. Morning, Mamas morning, not just re- reading it. Morning, crying every night for destruction of Beit HaMikdash, understanding what it even means. Six, lower all materialism, all the joys of your life, all of the things you like a lot, lower them little by little to nothing. Seven, destroy all of the bad midot. Stinginess, anger, uh, arrogance, whatever, all those bad things. A person that eats too much, a person that, uh, whatever, all these different things, you have to destroy all of them. Purify yourself regularly. This is why people go to the mikveh. But if you go to the mikveh, Mechalel Shabbat, it's not going to help you. If you go to the mikveh and still waste seed, it's not going to help you. You could dip in the entire ocean every day. You could live in the ocean like a fish. It's not going to help you. If you live in the ocean, it's the best mikveh in the world, by the way. But if you still waste seed, still mechalel Shabbat, still stingy, still angry, still haven't worked on a single midah in 70 years, you haven't worked on a single midah, even if you live like a dolphin in the ocean, it's not going to help you. Purify means that after you're already pure with your actions, you purify yourself even more. Ninth is it bodedut. It bodedut doesn't necessarily mean go to the desert or go to the uh, forest. And hang out with some bears. It would do it is empty out your mind of all the natural, all the material, and connect to Hashem Barach to the deepest level, meditating. 
meditating, focusing on Hashem Barach, moving your mind to the next worlds, the seven worlds above us, the, the highest level, keep going higher and higher, all the way to the highest, the, the Kisei HaKavod. It's not just, oh yeah, I'm just going to sit there and uh, eat uh, potato chips and feel good about myself. That's not it, Oh, I'm just going to go in the, in, the, in the forest, hang out with the trees and appreciate the flowers. Okay, appreciate the flowers. That's not it, Bodedut. It, Bodedut is praying deeply and thanking Hashem for everything and asking for nothing. Praise Him. Talk to Him. This is not a request contest. Oh, give me this, give me this, give me this. He's not a genie. Give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me more money, give me more money. What are you at? You're with the dude, you're asking for more money. You're missing the whole point. So your step seven was remove the whole aspect of money. Step number ten even surprised me. Yirat Shemaim. Get to Yirat Shemaim. Why? There's levels of Yirat Shemaim. Not just Yirat Onish that even a dog has. Yirat Shamayim, where Yirat Romimut get to a level of connection with Hashem Barach to such a level that it's a marriage. You're afraid to hurt the marriage. You're afraid to hurt the relationship you have with Hashem Barach. You're afraid to hurt the king. You're afraid to put a hole in the dress. After that, get to loving Hashem. Loving Hashem is higher. But only after you have the highest level of Yirat Shemaim. From here we learn that the highest level of Yirat Shemaim is the beginning of loving Hashem. Meaning anyone that tells you I love Hashem, that means that by default, either they're crazy and they have no idea what it means, or they have the highest level of Yirat Shemaim, which means that they sh- you should listen to their Shiot Torah. Most people are the first option. After midnight, after you've gone to all those levels, after midnight, put a talit on, candles, make sure it's quiet, empty your mind completely, start getting your mind to go up to the higher world. If you don't know what this means, then obviously you still have to work on step number 1 through 11. Get your mind to travel to the higher worlds. Ultimately, you will eventually arrive at a special feeling. A feeling of Ruach HaKodesh. If, he says, if there's no special feeling, stop. Go back to step one. Go back home. Do tshuva. Work specifically on your Yirat Shamayim and your materialism. Because those two things are like the last few steps that are make or break it. Meaning your your materialism, you're still connected to material or you still have not enough uh, Yirat Shemaim. After you've attained it, come back and do the whole thing again. Now he says, even if you achieve this, listen to this part, even if you achieve this, you get this special feeling you should always know and always be concerned that this feeling could still not be Ruach HaKodesh, but instead could be from the Sitra Achra. Meaning, instead of connecting to Hashem, you connect it to the Satan instead, Hashem Yerachem. Meaning it could be a fake Ruach HaKodesh. Never, be, never trust yourself for a second. Why? Because for the special Tzadikim, the Satan waits for them around the corner. He isn't just there. Oh, they don't just become Sadiqim uh, just because they learn some Torah. Now, all of this, there's always a risk of the Satan getting involved. There's always a risk of the Satan ruining everything. He's always waiting. It's bigger, it's the bigger the Tzadik, the bigger the danger. That's why sometimes you'll see big Tzadikim in history fell. Big. Now, all of this, of what I just said, is not possible without step one, which we skipped. What's step one? What is step one, Rabotai? Step one, Rabotai, is completing tshuva. 
destroying all of these midot that we have, meaning working on all of our midot, completing tshuva completely. There's no sin that you're making knowingly. But not only are you doing tshuva for this world, you're doing tshuva for your previous gilgulim. Now, how do you know what you did in the past? How do you know what sins you made in the past? What's most difficult for you today? It's difficult for you to be modest. That's because you were putza in the previous Gilgul. It's difficult for you to keep Shabbat and so on. That's because you were lackadaisical within the previous Gilgul. It's, pre- it's difficult for you to do this, do this. That's because in the previous Gilgul, that's where you messed up. Meaning you're not only doing tshuva for the obvious things, you have to do tshuva, the things that you know are difficult for you here. It's for the previous Gilgul. That's step one. That's step one. So you're still stuck with me for a while. 